Um, all right, well, it's 7 o'clock. Uh, everybody ready up here? Okay, good. Bartley, you're ready to go? All right, super. So, um, uh, welcome everyone. This is the uh, um, September 4th, yes, not 3rd, but 4th, regular meeting of uh, Village Council. And uh, with that, um, Judy, if you don't mind doing a roll call. No problem. How? Yes. Here, Kathleen. Yes. Stokes? Here. Krieger? Present. Also present is uh, <laughs> Bates. Right. Public Works Director Johnny Burns, Planning and Zoning uh, Administrator Dave Swinger, and Village Solicitor Chris Connor. Okay, great. So uh, next up we've got announcements. Um, Lisa, do you have any announcements? Um, well, sure I do. Um, I want to announce that this uh, weekend the World House Choir is doing a series of concerts about a social um, justice leader named Fire Rustin, um, who has been considered to be sort of the man behind the dream. He's the person who introduced Martin Luther King Jr. to pacifist approaches. But he um, was sort of lost from the public eye for periods of time uh, because he was an out black man. And so he's been kind of lost uh, to history. And we're performing uh, uh, the second time that this piece of music has been performed. So it's practically a premiere. We're performing this on um, Friday night at the Foundry Theater at Antioch College at 7 o'clock. It's free. And we're also. Oh, sorry, we're performing Thursday night and Saturday night at the Foundry at the Antioch Theater at 7 o'clock, and it's free. We're also performing it in Dayton on uh, Friday night, and we're also performing in Cincinnati on Sunday. So we hope that a lot of people come. Typically, the World House Choir uh, fills the Foundry Theater, so if you intend to come, uh, try to come a little early so you get a seat. See you there. Thanks. Alright, thanks a lot. Uh, any other announcements? Uh, go ahead, Patty. Uh, I just want to announce the ribbon cutting for the water treatment plant. will be on September 18th at 10 a.m. at the water treatment plant on Jacoby Road. You are welcome to attend. If you would like to, please RSVP to um, Ruth Ann Lillick at 767-3402. All right, now I have a few things I want to mention. Um, first of all, uh, I want to uh, highlight something that was brought to my attention, which I know we're on top of, which is the fact that we do not allow bikes to ride on the sidewalks, especially in the downtown. And uh, I mean, I personally came out of Tom's the other day and almost uh, got run down. Um, but we're going to get those signs back out there. and. Uh, Harvey Page brought that to our attention as well, um, and I know he sent an email, I think, today. Um, but anyway, so we're on top of that. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think it's good to, to keep on people's uh, radar, our John Bryan Community Gallery opening, which is going to be September 27th from 6 to 9. We have a really amazing exhibit that's very locally focused right now. And uh, I just got confirmation that we have Joseph Glenn, uh, our favorite steel drummer in the region, playing. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then finally, I wanted to just mention there's a lot of stuff going on this weekend. And, and I want to briefly highlight um, Saturday, we have the 9-11 stair climb at Antioch College. I believe that you know, if you decide you're ready to uh, climb 110 stories of stairs, that you can just show up uh, that morning. I'm going to be there doing it. Um, Cyclops Fest is also this Saturday. Uh, we did not have it last year, so it's great that it's uh, back this year. And um, I had mentioned the Trails Transform America event in Xenia, which I strongly encourage any of our uh, local elected officials and other government folks that are in town to stop by and not only see what's going on in Xenia, but particularly the protected bike lane that has been put downtown is, is really uh, exciting, and that's what this event is celebrating. I thought Marianne and I were going to bike down there together, so I guess uh, I don't know, I'm disappointed. Um, <laughs> and then um, the Wiseau Community Concert is September 9th. 
Um, so that's Sunday, and uh, I think that was everything. But it will be six to nine. Yeah, um, right here on the second floor. Um, okay, so. There are no other, other announcements. We've got the consent agenda, which is the minutes of August 20th. And I would love to have a motion to approve that consent agenda. Move. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, all right, reviewing the agenda. Any things that uh, oh, oh. folks would like to propose to add and change? I have um, those short. Not announce, not announce but a short project. I'd like to have a short time to talk about a project that Antioch student is doing, and uh, I'd like to see what council members and perhaps staff might be able to help with this. Okay, so new business? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, anything else? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the sidewalk thing. I was going to, I thought that would be a longer discussion. I was going to introduce that as an idea for new business, but. You've covered it, I just didn't know, because I know there was some, uh, an existing ordinance, and I thought there needed to be some discussion about enforcement, but if announcing it covers the basis, because I was supposed to saying people. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, anything else? Um, so I am going to pull the uh, vote, vote 16 gun control uh, topic from new business because a couple things are going on right now, and I think my report will be more interesting uh, at our next meeting, so. I, I wanted to mention the surveillance ordinance is not on this agenda because there's so little bit of work being done on it. Okay. So that was, I believe, uh, in the newspaper, but it'll come you back the next meeting. Great, okay. Um, so with that, uh, Marianne, petitions and communications. Yes, uh, we got a, a, a voice communication. <laughs> I've never gotten that before. From Samuel Jackson, who's a resident of Yellow Springs who lives on uh, Land Road. Apparently a tree fell on his electric line and he was calling in to say what professional work Johnny and the crew did to get the electricity for. So, kudos. Uh, Jim Hammond had a letter in the packet about the lodging packs and appealed uh, it. Bill Randolph uh, had a letter thanking HRC, which gave a grant to enable the project that helps supply school children with backpacks and uh, school equipment, and that helped uh, that project immensely. And lastly, there's a regional health their Health Expo in Springfield on October 2nd. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, so we're going to move into public hearings and legislation. And uh, first of all, we've got Ordinance 2018-30. And um, Judy, I think we can read that in my title. All right. This is amending the official zoning map of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for the property located at 117 East North College Street. Parcel ID, I'm just going to skip that, on 0.905 acres from EI Educational Institution to RC High Density Residential District. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? Move. Second. Okay. All right. Denise? Okay. So, Antioch College um, is uh, planning to do a pocket neighborhood development. Um, one of the first steps um, is they'll need to rezone to a residential area. Uh, because the pocket neighborhood developments are only allowed in residential areas uh, A, B, or C. Um, Antioch College's proposed um, location abuts residential C on both the north and west sides, and um, they meet the, there are five requirements to rezone. Um, in my opinion, they meet those requirements, most notably uh, infill development, increased housing stock, um, as well as um, it's not a spot zone. Okay. Um, and I think uh, council members may know this is the Antioch College Village pilot. Um, there was a great presentation. And actually, I should also mention uh, on September 12th, um, there's going to be another presentation of the Antioch College Village um, 
concept uh, at the Coretta Scott King Center. So, uh, all right. Uh, questions or comments from council? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would acknowledge that um, rezoning in and of itself, I think, provides no immediate direct benefit to the college. But as a staff member of the college, if anyone feels I should recuse myself from the discussion, I will do that. You should recuse. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments from council? Seems like a great project. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I just really appreciated um, Denise the documentation. Felt like it was very very clear um, and answered my questions. In addition to the um, McLennan design document that gave you know I think really helpful visuals for us to understand what you know what is really what this might look like. So I really appreciate the preparation that went into the packet. As well as the work of planning commission. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah we will be meeting again uh, next uh, Monday for the conditional use hearing. Yeah, well, it's incredibly exciting, <clears throat> and I mean, this is what we wanted to see is the pocket Thanks. neighborhood development being used. Yeah. So, um, uh, so Denise, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from citizens? Uh, oh, Malta, please. Sure. Um, so, my name is Malta. I'm Matheson, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the College and chair of the facilities committee under which this project falls. Um, I arrived in Yellow Springs in 1961 to attend Antioch College, and um, I have been very passionate about the college and the community village in Yellow Springs collaborating and building a cooperative relationship. Um, so this proposal is really a first step, I think, in that direction. Plus, we're taking a piece of land that is currently zone E, don't pay any taxes, and we're changing it to C, which means it'll start to pay taxes to the benefit of the community. Maybe not a large amount, but some. Um, this project is an outgrowth of the Antioch College Village, which was developed and presented to the community, and 2015. And however, given the man magnitude of that project, we decided to scale it back to something that we felt that was more manageable and that we could learn from. And um, that's the reason we're making this proposal and presenting this to the village. So we believe that this project, we the Board of Trustees believe that this project is right in the sweet spot with the dialogue already underway in the village. Um, regarding affordable housing and sustainable housing, and also uh, the initiatives that are underway with Home Inc. So, thank you for listening. All right, thanks a lot, Malta. You bet. And uh, I mean, I think that is a good point to emphasize that you know one of the things that we are very interested in is is any kind of infill and other activity that's supporting our housing goals to provide diversity of housing. Also, I want to congratulate Antioch College on the sustainable campus recognition um, that we heard about last week. That is really awesome, and this obviously ties right into that. Um, so uh, I think it is, even though this is a first reading, I think it's worthwhile to take a vote. So, um, Judy, I guess we'll do a roll call. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hemphlin. Yes. Stokes. Oh, I'm sorry. You have recused. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. Kevin, come on back up. All right. Um, and as Kevin's walking up, we're going to move on to Ordinance 2018-32, and that can also be read in by title. I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> this is approving amendments to Part 10, Streets, Utilities, and Public Services Code, Title 6, Other Services of Chapter 1060, Storage and Collection of Garbage and Other Wastes, Regulating Charges Related to the Services to the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and Declaring an Emergency. Okay, I'll entertain the motion. Moved. Second. All right, um, so Patty, is this you? This is me. Um, so as council knows, we passed this at the last meeting, but um, I, in my 
hurry to get it done before I went on vacation to get it to Judy. We neglected to take into account that we actually um, add a little bit to the Rumpke rates to help pay for the salaries and of the ladies down in the utility office and to pay for the spring cleanup that we have. So what you see in front of you is an amended ordinance that passes on the 3% increase that we got from Rumpke to the citizens. It does not add anything else to it. It's 3% across the board that Rumpke gave us this year and 3% next year. So that's what's added into this ordinance. And the reason that we're doing that is this fund runs like in and out. It is not, doesn't carry a heavy balance. It doesn't do any of those things. So it was necessary to make sure that we were passing on that increase in addition to what we were charging. So that was my mistake that I apologize. Being in a rush. OK. Any questions or comments from council? Um, and since this is, uh, and why are we declaring it an emergency type? Um, because technically our contract with Rumpke expired September 1st. Um, and Rumpke did not get us the amended rates until right before the last meeting. So we were reading it as an emergency then. Awesome. I'm glad they did their pickup service today. Right. Um, so uh, with that, uh, since this is uh, an emergency, um, I'll open the public uh, discussion. All right. If there are no questions or comments, uh, Judy, if you can uh, do the roll call, please. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Humphrey. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Huff. Yes. OK. 2018-34, um, and uh, I think we should read this in full. This is enacting new section 1040.12 entitled Utility Roundup Fund, creating a utility roundup fund for utility overpayment and disbursement and declaring an emergency. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs accepts payments from customers for each of its utilities, and whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs has determined that it would be in the best interest of the Village to establish a fund whereby customers can choose to overpay their utility bills by rounding up their payments to a whole dollar amount and applying those overpayments to a designated fund with monies held for the benefit of qualifying utility customers of the Village who are in need and request financial assistance in paying a delinquent utility bill. And whereas this designated fund shall be created and titled the Utility Roundup Fund for this purpose, now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1. The Village shall create a designated utility roundup fund for the purpose of assisting qualifying Village utility, utility customers who request financial assistance with the payment of delinquent utility bills for the Village operated utilities. Section 2. As part of the establishment of the utility roundup fund, Village customers can choose to overpay their Village operated utility bills by rounding up to a whole dollar amount. The Village may also accept donations from the utility roundup fund. All funds received in accordance with this section shall be deposited in the Utility Roundup Fund. Section 3, the Village Finance Director and Manager shall create, with the approval of Council, policies, regulations, and procedures to administer and operate the Roundup Fund. Section 4, this ordinance is hereby declared to be an emergency measure authorized under the Village's Home Rule powers set forth in its charter and the Ohio Constitution, and necessary for the benefit of the health, safety, and welfare of the Village to assist with necessary utility services for qualifying Village service citizens. This ordinance shall take effect immediately upon approval by Village Council. <coughs> Thanks, Judy. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Okay. Heidi? Uh, you should be oh, watching where you want me to. Sure, I'll be glad to. So, um, we've been working on establishing a utility roundup fund for a number of months. Um, we have discussed in the past the criteria for participation, and so what, the, what this is. Uh, ordinance is about is that in order to launch the program we have to create a new fund in the accounting in our books so that requires an ordinance so that's really all this ordinance is it creates the approval to set up an account to put the roundup money in and as the ordinance states um, it's both the opportunity for people to round up to the nearest dollar so in other words 99 cents would be your greatest um, monthly donation if you did that or we also know that some people in our community are interested in donating larger amounts to help people who are in need so this ordinance is simply to establish the fund to hold those monies 
and I would also like to point out that once we pass our ordinance, we have to send it to the state auditor, who then has 30 days to approve us setting up that line. So if you are interested in donating, please wait for our announcement, because right now we don't have the accounting line to put that in. We will make that announcement as soon as we get the approval from the state. And am I correct in, in saying that part of the reason why that we're um, declaring it to be an emergency measure is the timeline that we are trying to hit. We want to have this program in place by no later than January 1st. Um, we know that it's really important for the community in winter when the utility costs are very high. So we're trying to move this forward as quickly as we can. And there's just these certain hurdles and processes that we have to follow. And so the hope is if we are able to start taking donations in October, <coughs> by the time we start dispersing in January, we'll be in a good place to be able to help. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, where are we at with the nonprofit to facilitate the utility roundup program? The senior center has a great yeah. yeah. Oh, we're delighted. We're delighted Excellent. that the senior center. We so because of the way that these programs are structured. None of us, and the village isn't in the in the decision making seat to say to someone, you know, to someone get the roundup money or not. Mm -hmm. So we establish the criteria, but then we work with a nonprofit partner, and so the Yellow Spring Senior Center has agreed to fulfill that role, and we're very grateful for that. Excellent. So we will anonymize the applications. Okay. So that there are no names or addresses, they will be simply account numbers, and that is that information is what the senior center will work with is that, that application. Yeah, just to be clear, this is you know when we research these kinds of programs, this is the best practice, and so we wanted to make sure to follow that, so it's not politicized. Um, I I'd just like yeah. to say we we started looking into this about two years ago, mm -hmm. and so it's taken a while, but actually get it rolling. I think there are probably only two other towns in Ohio to have this and, and they're scattered throughout the country but I think it's a great way for people to voluntarily who can help those who can. I want to add the just to be clear that the program is you have to opt in to the program yes. for the round up. The typical is Lisa advised where the you're just rounding up to the whole dollar. That's where you opt in. Then uh, the bill is going to be modified where you'll also have the opportunity to periodically say on that bill, I also uh, you know, want to add an additional $50. And show of hands, everybody wants to do that. Right? <laughs> right. Or so, $5. No, 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 no. Something we can do the five. Okay. Um, so again, so again, not to alarm folks, it's opt-in. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. But certainly you can make changes on a monthly basis whether you want to do it. And I think that was my other maybe question or comment is I think I think the way the resolution is worded or the ordinance is worded, it accommodates you know that you can round up to the next dollar, or you can round up to the next ten dollars, and so you know. Uh, or you can just walk rough. into the utility office and say I would like to donate this money to the utility roundup fund. You would like to do that. Um, I was going to say something about the, the marketing side of things, but I believe that's just talking about get the line. And maybe, maybe we should also say the purpose is to help people who get, who have like a one time, once a year need, pretty much like had a health crisis, lost their job, whatever happened. And so there, there are criteria that, that have to, people have to meet. Um, all right, so since we are declaring an emergency, I will open the public hearing for any questions or comments, please. Good evening, I'm Leslie Shepard. I'd like to know what the village is doing about lowering the rates for everybody. Dallas Resume had an article a while ago that talked about the great surpluses in each fund. And even Village, I don't know who it was exactly, had said perhaps we've been overcharging. I personally called DPNL recently and discussed with somebody in a position there to talk about it. I read them the particulars of a bill I had from Yellow Springs for electricity and kilowatt hours and the time and all that. My $77 bill from the Village would have been $40 with DPNL. 
So what are we doing about we have these tremendous hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in the water fund and the you know, util various utilities. Why are we not lowering the rates or doing something instead of setting up more nonprofits and more this and more that and, you know, trying to get other people to pay? So that's my comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know and I am going to the economic sustainability meeting tomorrow. That was suggested to me, which is fine. But why do we do something about the high rate? That, that, there, there, this is something we are taking very seriously. In particular, Lisa has been reviewing, as I'm sure you know, or maybe you don't know, that for a long time, the village did not have a capital fund for capital improvements. So anyone who owns a house or anything knows to put money away for those things. We're starting to do that now. And at the same time, our budget, we're going to be looking at the budget starting in what, October next month. And I imagine we will be looking very seriously at the utilities. I appreciate but, but this is not a money, that, you know, that just sort of rather similarly to our trash pickup. It's not, the money that comes into the utilities has to go out to I understand that. I know it's not a way to generate revenue for the village to do other things. It's just, and I think I had this discussion briefly before, that the village believes that utilities should be gotten from certain sources and not from the sources DP&L uses. And that's fine for people to have those ideals, that's fine, but it is presumptuous and I think a hardship on people when you have your the ideals, which are almost twice as expensive as DPNL. So, could I? Uh, yeah, please. please. Um, so, two things. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that the village does have those contracts, which you were just referring to for green energy, and we are locked into those contracts unless we sell them. And I'll be honest with you, when the when it comes up time to review the portfolio, the energy board looks at that makes recommendations whether to sell or not. There are some contracts we're just not going to sell. We're not going to sell our hydro projects because, first of all, others are very heavily invested in them already, um, and they're long-term contracts. Um, so for the next 45 years, Johnny? I, I think it's 40. We're locked into those contracts. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, when I understand that when you look at the balances, you see huge surpluses. But we just presented to council an infrastructure work session that went three hours and could have gone much longer, explaining to them the things that haven't been kept up and need to be. And the two RFPs that we had in for a stormwater survey and an electric system survey are just two of the many indicators of what we need to, to uh, get. Now, I will point out that when you look at a surplus of $2 million in the electric fund, our power costs are around $4 million a year. So when you see that surplus, that's not, it's, it's an in and out. And yes, we're putting money aside, but we don't have nearly the money set back in our capital funds. I understand what you're saying. Maybe we're too small to be doing that on our own. Maybe we should have DPNL or somebody who does all that, but we could pay half the bill. But we still have to pay the contracts whether we go with DPNL or not. Well, that's because whoever it may be has made these 40-year commitments, which I have to question that. But that's another story. Thank you. I, I want to say, too, in terms of uh, we shouldn't just focus at the renewable energy uh, resources or uh, resources that are paying for our elect or uh, providing our electric. We turned down uh, a couple of coal plants uh, that was recommended by AMP, AMP Ohio at the time, it's now AMP, in our consortium, our energy consortium. Uh, it turned out that those decisions were excellent decisions financially. So um, because those, uh, the, they ended up being big boondoggles basically. And so, you know, the notion that, uh, just the notion that because we have, you know, looked to renewables is costing us more. In fact, uh, there were, options we had that we turned down that were non-renewables, dirty, dirty electric, um, and they would have cost us more because uh, the projects ended up being a really bad idea. 
And so I think those were excellent decisions that we made. But, but uh, the, in terms of the hydro, they cost a lot now. I can't speak to the details of it. But later, they're going to cost a lot less. It's one of those things where you pay up front, but in the end, like, you know, what the, the power we get from Niagara Falls, you know, we're not, we're not, right now it's free, basically. We so Yeah, we, we make, make money on it. So it's, yeah, it's, I thought that wasn't your goal. All I'm saying is the bp is between 5.4 and 5.9 cents a kilowatt hour today. Um, Lisa? Yeah, um, I just want to turn back time a little bit to closer to the beginning of the year when there was a presentation um, about our financial status and the amount of money in the various <coughs> accounts. And I think that was presented in a very positive light to say, the, you know, these are the positive balances in, in this account. I think where that was coming from was, as Mary Ann says, that it hasn't been that long that the village did not have any kind of a surplus account sitting in those funds to take care of the infrastructure. And all you would have to do is walk around the town and you can see the work that needs to be done. And as I've come to understand that you look underneath the streets and that's really where, you know, the, the expenditures need to come. I think maybe where that presentation at that point in the year wasn't handled as well as it might be was to say, we have something to celebrate. We have money to do some, not all, but some of the things that we need to do to take care of our, of our house. Think of Yellow Springs as your house. And you may have a bunch of money in the bank, but if you need a new furnace and a new roof and a new hot water heater, that money in the bank is not money that you can just say, let's spend it. It's money that you have set aside to do these kinds of projects. And so for me, what I've learned in my tenure on council is that those positive balances are only meaningful when you look at them against the challenges that we have to keep our village safe to keep the streets safe, to keep the plumbing running, to keep the stormwater running. And so, I, I, you know, in hindsight, I think when we present the balances on our accounts, we need to present them to say, yeah, this, there's, we have this much money, but we have this much that we need to spend. I think that presents a much more realistic view for the community rather than to think that we're just sitting on a bunch of money that we're not giving back to the community. But with that said, I do want to underscore what Marianne said, and that is that we are looking very, very closely at these dollar amounts, and if there is any way that we can give back to the community without giving up something that will get in the way of safety and for the community, we will. But I'm not kind of confident at this point that we can, given what I know about our infrastructure in the village. So I just want to quickly add, um, you know, first of all, uh, we are going to be thinking very seriously, and this is why the presentation was made, as to what we can reasonably do year on year. Um, so if, you know, we can determine that there are um, excesses in our funds, then, as Lisa said, we will figure out ways to, you know, uh, push that back. But I guess I, I do want to mention something that kind of brings us back to what this ordinance is about. Um, first of all, I think it's important to remember we're talking about sustainable energy. And so, you know, again, underscoring the point that while it may be expensive in the short term, uh, eventually these sort of bad energy choices are, are not going to be viable for anyone. So the fact that we're being proactive about that is ultimately going to keep the village sustainable. But the other thing I'll say is we respond to the folks that we represent. And so if we need to change the choices that we've made, um, I mean, we all responded to the fact that villagers in mass want local control, um, wanted a new power plant that we have control over to make sure our water quality is, is the best it can be, making sure that we have energy choices that meet our village values. And so I will say that the Roundup program is patterned on DPNL. All right. The reason why most municipalities don't get involved in this is because it's very complex. So we have created a venue for 
doing just what a private company like DPNL that supposedly is providing a lot cheaper options. I mean, I don't know if that's really true or not, but this is what we have. Five point four cents a kilowatt. Hour. Okay, well that's fine, but we, you know, I'm not going to argue that as much to say that we have set this up, and and so this is kind of a separate issue. I mean, there are issues about village values and choices we make around utilities, but the utility roundup is something that we are now providing to our citizens in need um, that only private companies typically do and it's you municipalities. <coughs> um, so uh, any other comments or questions from uh, the community? Okay, um, so uh, this is an emergency. I will close the public hearing and uh, Judy, if you could call the roll. Yes, Krieger. Yes. Stokes? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sampling? Yes. Hatch? Yes. Okay. Um, 2018-32, uh, this is a resolution that we can read in. Let's read it in full. There's some good stuff in there. Okay, this is awarding a contract for sidewalk trip hazard repairs for precision concrete cutting. Whereas council has received a proposal for sidewalk trip hazard repair from precision concrete cutting. And whereas council agrees that the method presented in the proposal seems an acceptable method for increasing the means of safe passage on sidewalks throughout the village. And whereas council would like to see this method applied to a portion of sidewalks in the village to confirm that the method provides the desired results on a wide basis. And whereas precision concrete cutting has an existing patent on the process used and is therefore a sole supplier of this preferred method, now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Spring, Ohio, does hereby resolve that. Section 1, a contract in the amount of $22,961.25 is hereby awarded to Precision Concrete Cutting of Westchester, Ohio. Section 2, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to enter into a contract with Precision Concrete Cutting to complete the known improvements. All right. I'll entertain the motion. Moved. Second. Okay. John? <laughs> the... Uh, Areas that we're talking about doing the start of for this cutting is uh, all of the downtown areas, including Glen Street, South Walnut, Xenia Street from the beginning to the end, north to south, and Dayton Street as well. Those will be the areas done for the $22,000 some more dollars. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what's special about precision? Uh, they've come up with a formula that actually will take the trip hazards from two inches or from it basically an eighth inch to two inches and that they, they know exactly where to cut it uh, and they cut it to where it's ADA compliant and uh, they move from sidewalk to sidewalk they'll just continue to go on down the road and there's only a certain if only one side is lifted up they're only going to cut that one side they're not going to cut all the way across. So we used them at the swimming pool. They did a demonstration. They took about a four thousand dollar fix and did it for nothing in about twenty two minutes. I'm glad we're doing just a piece to see yep. how it works. How noisy! It it's going to be noisy. So we probably should let businesses and the correct. We're, we'll give it to businesses when it's uh, time to do it in front of them. Give them plenty of notice. Hopefully, we can do the downtown before everybody opens up. We can piece that. Um, and so I recall that th this is a proprietary technology, mm -hmm. and I guess the other thing is that they took it upon themselves to look at what they, they did. They the did a complete uh, visit of the village. They marked out uh, 1,308 spots that they could use their technology on, and there's 88 spots that they cannot. And those we'll, we'll have to tear up and redo. But right now we want to try to get this one started, especially the downtown area and the main drags going through town. And this this will give us a better idea. Yes, we've had a demonstration, but it will give us a really good idea on a widespread basis as to whether this is going to actually give us the results that we're looking for. Great. Tony, when for the 88 or so that you that this process won't apply to, when are you going to? start with those? I have to come up with a uh, tax plan and go off of pricing. Because mm -hmm. there's some that is completely not. I mean, we're going to have to revisit the whole Mercer Court area because 15, 50 percent, you know, you're going to tear off 15 and then you got 50 left. So we need to evaluate that whole situation. But 
right now I think is trying to minimize the trip hazards in town and uh, seeing more money we can spend to fix the other ones as we go forward. And I think also, um, I'm not sure that all council members have heard, but um, we're looking at a, a, a next Safe Routes to School grant application. And so, you know, I want us to think about, you know, those spots that would be within that footprint um, as well that will help fund some of the sidewalk work. Um, have we, so I know that we sort of have generally set aside 50000 a year for sidewalks. Have we spent any of that this year, or this will be? The okay. ODOT uh, ramp fund was budgeted for thirty-two thousand, mm -hmm. and it come in at fifty-six thousand. So we spent every bit of the money for the ODOT grant. That was our match. You mean? That was our match. Okay. And that actually starts uh, September fifteenth. Then when they start doing those sidewalk and curbs. I didn't know we did another problem. Yes, September fifteenth. Um, so we spent our, our funds on the match this year. So this would be above and beyond the budget. But I think it was also presented that if we do it now, when we do we it now, we do it. Correct. We was able to save like, I think it was $10,000 if we do it in, before October of 2018. Or sign, sign. We signed the contract by 20, October of 2018. Right. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Megan? I have two questions sure. for you. Um, just how did this come, up, come about? Did they approach the village? Um, how many of the 1,300 spots does this initially address? And then the location of the curbs you were just mentioning that are going to be? Uh, the location of the curbs, Denise, that is uh, the finish in Dayton Street and West South College. So that will uh, finish the ADA ramps. And is he? And, and does it go all the way around? I think Xenia's done. Xenia was done last year. <coughs> so this is West South College and and East Dingen and Dayton Street. And there's some there's one on at least one that went turned on. Yeah, a little little. Yeah, just a little section right there. Um, I would have to get you the exact number of the areas out of the thirteen hundred name. I don't have that. You can ask them I'm going to say probably about an eighth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or a fifth. Yeah, it could be a it could be a fifth. Because yeah, the quote was yeah, 120. Yeah, is 120. So for the full Six. right. So Six. I can get to the exact number. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually cold called us and uh, they wanted to come out and do a demonstration for us, and I took them straight to the pool. So that was the number one area I needed right there. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Shelly. Any other uh, questions or comments from citizens? Okay. If not, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, 2018 um, uh, Judy, if we could again read it in full. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to pull up the map, which this is just going to take forever to do, so I'll pull up. Whereas the village, I'm sorry, this is a funding village council priority for council land trust easement purchases. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs has long been dedicated to the preservation of green space, and whereas the village council has to that end established a green space fund to assist in the purchase of easements on certain properties that council deems important to our green space goals. And whereas council has worked with Tecumseh Land Trust to establish priorities related to the purchase of said easements. Now, therefore, be it resolved <clears throat> by Council for the Village of Yellow Springs that Section 1, Council does hereby specify that the properties in red and yellow on Exhibit A attached here to are of first importance for preservation. Section 2 that those properties within the five year time of travel zone adjacent to the Village of Yellow Springs water treatment plant are hereby designated as a second priority. And Section 3 that those properties in blue on Exhibit A attached here to are designated as a third priority for preservation. Okay, uh, can I get a motion? No. Second. Okay. All right. Um, Marianne? <clears throat> um, I think probably for a long time the village has had an interest in preserving the area along Jacoby Creek in particular, and also, of course, around our bluffiness, from which we get our water. 
so what about a year ago I guess Council Land Trust was awarded a federal grant uh, for uh, I'll, I'll let Chris come up in a minute and you can explain um, which uh, and, and on which we are going to focus on the areas just described so on the map those areas in red and then the, the yellow uh, follow the Jacoby Creek this um, a big reason for this is that it it ensures that the sprawl as it comes from Fairborn won't come into the village. I do I do also want to say that when we were doing the housing conversations, there were people who were concerned about the green belt, and the concern was that it was the green belt that was constricting the village. In fact, the Jacoby Green Belt, as you can see. Uh, well, there are space, there's property between the village boundary and the green belt. So it still does allow the village to grow. Uh, and that was and is a concern of mine, uh, that there is space for the village to continue to grow. Uh, so at any rate, this uh, resolution is uh, affirming those properties as the properties that we want to target. And, yeah, Kristen, I think that would be great. Chris, if you want to. I mean, we just kind of briefly bring this sort of into context with why this is so important. Okay, sure. Uh, Kristen McGough, I uh, live in Hills Terms as well as working for Tecumseh Land Trust. Um, we um, have, we work with a two county area. Just to say, we started uh, in Miami Township here, and now we work with Clark County and Green County. Um, and we serve our number one goal is really to protect water resources. But we have become really well known as um, people who work with landowners who own farmland who would like to preserve the conservation values of those properties. And we've been good at finding money for those landowners who want to do that. So one of the things I want to make sure to underline tonight is that um, we only work with landowners who are interested in perhaps selling some of their their land value to place a conservation easement on their land. So uh, with the village's uh, blessing of, okay, these are our priorities, then that tells me where the village would be willing to put some of their matching resources that are a part of this project. But where it land interior to that is not going to generally be land that we will in any way uh, really reach out about because we understand what the village's priorities are. And we try to do that with the, the land use plan in Clark County and Green County. Um, this is the only municipality that's really wanted to have a green belt around it. Uh, there definitely is changing thinking about land use planning, uh, not just within the village, but within the range that the urban service boundaries can can uh, address. So where can you use gravity sewer and you know at a cost-effective kind of uh, scenario extend water as well. Um, I want to make sure that everybody also understands that the land trust is uh, very willing to keep working with you guys uh, but the reason that we, we do really welcome this resolution is that uh, we have to roll out this project. We got $1.44 million of federal money to pay people to put conservation uh, practices on their land. So that's like buffer strips along the creek to help uh, filtrate that water that's flowing off the farm fields. And a number of other cover crops, a number of other conservation practices. I, I think it's close to 100 that, that can be paid. We never had access to money like that. And we'll be working with the Soil and Water District on administering that. So um, that's very exciting because in a town that cares about conservation, I think we can have some very good demonstrations uh, of best practices. And of course, the area is, is sort of ready to go on that. Um, you know, let this, those monies could apply to areas that have easements already as, as well. Uh, we've got $2.3 million committed from other entities. Uh, the, the village committed the Green Space Fund up to $200,000 of that, of that fund. Um, we have money, potentially, that could be used from Ohio EPA 
from uh, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, from the Ohio Public Works Commission. Um, there's Xylem, YSI is a partner on this. The Ellsberg Schools are a partner on this. So we really have got a lot of people ready to, to come together and apply some expertise and hopefully demonstrate some good, good results. Um, so we'll need to start contacting landowners. We've got a rollout here at the Bryan Center on November 3rd. We're calling a landowner resource fair. And um, a part of the village's match is to provide space for that. So we'll have uh, speakers, uh, I believe, on the on the hour, basically, uh, a period between 11.30 and 4.30. We'll be getting a press release out about that very, very soon. Um, and then in the gym, we're going to have just a big variety of resources for landowners, some of them for people that don't own a farm or, or don't own a large natural property. So their land might, it might not make sense to do a conservation easement <coughs> on your you know, three acre property, but there may be some things that you can pick up in terms of free opportunities to have a better pollinator garden in your yard. Um, so we, we do welcome wide public participation in that. Um, and this is very helpful to us. I appreciate the council trying to move on this in time because we don't want to you know, mislead landowners. If, if we say we want to know if you're interested in this, we want to have some confidence that um, this is something that will we'll work with the village uh, goals. And as they change over time, we'll be looking at this every year. So this isn't something that's written in stone forever either. Um, but it, it, it's very helpful to have it in order to do this first year rollout. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from council? Uh, citizens, questions or comments? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, resolution 2018-35. Um, uh, we can read it in by title only. Sure. This is authorizing the village manager to issue a request for proposals for a comprehensive stormwater survey of the village. Can I get a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. All right. Uh, Patty? Uh, yes. This is uh, this came out of, out of part of the infrastructure uh, session that we had with council. There were two RFPs or RFQs that um, the staff was asked to put together. One was for a stormwater survey to look at stormwater improvements. Um, throughout the village. The other was the electric system survey. Um, so they're both here tonight. Um, if you have any questions about the drafts, um, we can go over them. We would like to issue these next week so that we can get them out and get them back and hopefully use them in budget planning for next year uh, and get these studies done. So the stormwater survey would be for the entire village to look at the infrastructure that we have as well as any potential modifications to that infrastructure or new additions um, for that infrastructure to um, improve the stormwater drainage in the village, which we all realize is just getting worse with the, the rains that we continue to see increasing uh, with the climate change. Uh, so I did have a question. Mm -hmm. I had asked that um, something you put in this RFQ to request uh, options for best practices and maximizing permeable surfaces as part of the stormwater reabsorption, mm -hmm. which I think is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I did, is it there? I didn't yes. So in section two, number four, um, explain your approach for this project and your understanding of the issues. The Village of Yellow Springs is open to considering multiple approaches to addressing these issues. Our goal is to understand the cause and each issue and find a solution. Do not assume that any approach is off the table. Would you like, like it to be more I, I'd specific? like it to say something about best practices and using the use of uh, increasing permeable surfaces. I, I mean, I'm not sure how it would be said uh, that we could we could put that in there. Um, I can make that adjustment. I think also it needs to be considered in the, the zoning code as well because that's where a lot of the permeable services. Because what we're talking about in this is more things like um, underground storm lines to take the water away, not necessarily the permeable surfaces. So okay. The, the best way for us to do it is if we can create swells and eliminate the pipes. Right. Right. Uh, but 
we don't want to tell them how to do it. We want them to come back with the best way, the, the most economic way for them to do it, and then we can look at their proposal, and then if we say, well, what if we did this? We don't want to, because if we tell them that we just want swells or we just want pipe, then they'll come back with a different number. Well, I, I don't, I'm not saying that we just want swales, but in terms of the whole water quality, issue all the way around. It's much better if water is reabsorbed into the Correct. soil. Mm -hmm. So I think that to the degree we can do that, uh, we should say we want to do that. I, I can modify that section to read, you know, um, natural and more permeable surfaces. Yeah, I think that would be good and maybe using the word innovative somewhere. Um, so, so that they can understand it. It's not it's a new thing, I don't think. Well, but it's not traditional, so. But we're also not putting in driveways, we're not doing sidewalks, we're just trying to divert the water that we're left with. And a lot of that's going to be done with spoils and with drainage pipe. If we was doing the parking lot, then that's where we would attack the uh, surfaces. But right now we're trying to get it out of the yards and the alleys and stuff like that. So we can make that modification. Okay. okay. Well, in some ways that makes me think that maybe we need to be really clear that our main priority is to understand sort of the, the map of stormwater, I, I don't know the right terminology, as opposed to because maybe we can figure out some of the solutions on our own. We want, so, if they, if the ideal of the study is, is they're going to tell us where our biggest problems is. Right and then be able to say, well, you can do this little bit here for this amount, but it could help with the rest of it. Okay. So be able to address little sections at a time. The pinch points, yeah. yeah, correct. Okay. Anything else? Is swales where you have the rain gardens? You can, the swale is more of a natural barrier that pushes the water a certain way. But you can have a rain garden in the soil. Yeah, I mean, my neighbors kind of have that, and it sucks the water up really fast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even know how that fits in. Okay. I guess my only comment is just to express appreciation to you, John, and, and Patty and staff for moving things along. You know, after our infrastructure meeting, it's very heartening to see these things moving along. I know it, it takes work. And there's competing priorities, so thank you for advancing this work. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from citizens? It, it, yes. To be honest, Liz, uh, Lisa, we appreciate council's support and helping us, encouraging us to do this. You know, I, I, I realize that the budget is a concern for a lot of people, but that's some, something of what has held us back. So. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And um, finally, 2018-36, again, title only is good. This is authorizing the village manager to issue a request for proposals for a comprehensive electric system survey of the village. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. How do you leave this off? Sure. Um, this, uh, this one looks a little bit different because we actually asked AMP to give us a draft of one that they had written that we could adjust to our own purposes because the electric system uh, is kind of a different animal. Um, and so um, the, there are a lot of different parts in this that have to be upgraded. As you can see, it's uh, the switching station, the two circuits, uh, the, the overhead lines looking for hot spots and cutouts and all of those things. We have also asked them to take into consideration what improvements we need to add for continued residential and economic uh, commercial development in the areas that we have available. So that is something that we have added in here because we felt that it was very important to have that information in order to be able to prioritize the third circuit and those kind of things and potentially a, a fiber broadband network. Um, John, if you want to? No, in fact, we, again, we left it open uh, because 
the third circuit may not be what we need. We may need larger conductors for the first half of both circuits, and it may be a cheaper uh, outcome for that, uh, doing away with a lot of the little small number six wire and going to larger wire. So we want to see what they propose and at the same time do a, a great analysis of the village and see where we stand in the whole so we know where to best spend the money. I really appreciate your comments. I mean, that, I mean, it, it, it didn't escape me, you know, that, uh, that you suggested that, you know, you want to be open, you know, and let the professionals, or, you know, the specialists suggest, and because I've always not been in the position that the Third Circuit was going to go, but, yeah, it might not be the remedy. Right. And, and uh, just on the water uh, uh, drainage uh, issue, if, if you get enough competent people making proposals, you know, you'll probably get, you know, the entire spectrum of possibilities uh, covered. So I think this uh, is a good way to go and to remain open and not be beholden to one desired outcome. Or another. Right. Let them think outside the box a little bit to try mm -hmm. to save some money. Right. right. Yeah, we've got a new song. Yeah, um, I just want to comment that this RFP and the subsequent electric engineering survey um, I think it's one of the most important things that I've seen come through Council this year. It speaks directly at the heart of Ms. Shepard's question about the balances in the account. Without the results from this electric engineering survey, we cannot truly understand what our financial situation is around these utilities. This is tremendously important and it can't happen quickly enough. So thank you for advancing the work. Yeah, I also agree. I mean, you know, we talked about prioritizing three things, uh, you know, this sort of sidewalk solution and these two studies because we need a plan. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, similar to the stormwater thing, I, I want to suggest a little bit of balance because some things that came up to me is, I mean, do they need to know that we have a solar array? that they will we'll okay. give them a complete walkthrough of the okay. system that we have. Good. Um, do they need to understand our relationship with AMP? You have a you have a pre con meeting. I do. So okay. So yeah. It's so by the, appointment. Yeah. Yes. So at the at the pre con meetings all of that will be explained to them. They'll get a normally what they get is a, a tour of the system, mm -hmm. um, you know, our relationship with AMP where our sources come from, all of those things. Okay. And then what about, um, should they, you know, I saw one of the attachments is our grid. Um, should we also be sharing with them what we're talking about related to infrastructure needs for, and again, I understand there's a balance between, you know, feeding. There is a balance, but we will we'll share with them what we think our primary <coughs> group will be with the glass farm, with okay. the fire department, with the CBE, with Enfield that we know of. Uh, we will be sharing that with them because I mean we need to let them know everything that we know so we can get the best product. Gotcha. How, how would you share that with them if it's not? We would get, no, it's on. It's on. It'll be on the map that we have. Oh. I didn't include the map. Uh, we will actually because it's a 26 by 40, so we want to be able to give them the maps and we'll show them where the infill and all the added leak is. Excellent. All right, great. Thanks, Johnny. Any other questions or comments? Citizens? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. So, citizens' concerns. This is the time of the meeting when we entertain comments uh, about anything that's not on the agenda. Uh, do we have any citizen concerns this evening? All right. I have. Yes, all time. Right. So, yeah. I didn't plan this, but uh, so I read this, the story of the paper, the stunning story of the paper brought for a lab. Mm. And um, I, re I remember, because wise I had the same problem, if you recall, back in 98 uh, and 2000. And we said, right, we're guilty, we're sorry. We cut a deal with the Ohio EPA, cleaned up. So here we are in 2018, and the folks from Fernay Labs are still 
trying to negotiate with us. It's amazing. So I have a suggestion. The person who was the lead at YSI and then Asylum YSI is Lisa Abel. She's retired from YSI and that's right. And why don't we She's think looking about looking for more things to do? Right? <laughs> why don't we think about bringing her on as a consultant or something to help us get this situation focused, so we can get it cleaned up, so we can use this piece of land, hopefully at some time in the future. So that's just a thought. Thanks, Malta. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other citizen concerns? Feedback. All right, we have no special reports. Um, so, Mary Ann, we're into old business and the Housing Advisory Board update. Yeah, a couple things. Um, first, I so, the Housing Advisory Board met and decided that it would be useful to invite some people in the community who deal with housing, realtors, building builders. Owning, reading that, the schools, I forget there was a list of maybe 15, 16 people, to uh, look at the presentation that David Bowen did regarding housing needs, price points of housing, heights of housing, etc. And so we're having a meeting on September 20th with um, the people that we've invited. And after that, then the board will get back together, consider that input, and start working on making recommendations to council. And I would hope that probably the second meeting in October, we would have a recommendation in terms of housing goals. Uh, the other thing that um, I mentioned is I just had noted that the Ohio, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency is having its conference in November. OFA, as it's called, and that is a really good place to network, both with developers, other communities that are doing affordable housing, as well as finding out what things the state is doing. They always have new rules and, uh, and opportunities. So I, I am interested in going. If it would work out with the needs to go, I think that would be great. At least it would be good for having a couple, at least a couple people from the housing board go. Does anyone have any questions or any 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 responses about David Bone's presentation? Patrick. Patrick Bowen? <laughs> I think I, I David Bowie or something. Yeah. <laughs> or, or Patrick's cousin too. <laughs> I also um, I, I was so appreciative of him donating his time. Mm -hmm really three times that he's come down here and, and also developed that presentation. So I actually wrote him a letter, a real letter, not an email, and sent it. And he, he came back with a, a response and said how much he appreciated it. He said, because in this world, you know, a lot of times you're getting kicked around and not getting appreciated. So no doubt. It. Great. All right. Uh, no other questions? Excellent. Um, okay, so we are going to move into the designated Community Improvement Corporation discussion. And Lisa, I can take that one. Okay, so um, we've had a series of updates on this. The most recent one, just to remind folks, um, a designated Community Investment Corporation is a uh, a type of organization that's recognized under 501c3. So it's, it's a, a nonprofit under the um, Internal Revenue Code. And it really has very broad potential powers, but the real work of uh, DCIC or Community Improvement Corporation is to help to advance economic, uh, community, and civic development of a community. So um, we worked with the um, Economic Sustainability Commission for a period of time, and uh, we have now taken the last um, report that was presented to council that summarized 
some potential powers and membership, we've begun to move it into a code of regulations template. So the code of regulations, think of that, for those of you who work with you know, nonprofits, sort of like the bylaws of a nonprofit. And that full document is not ready to be reviewed yet, um, but uh, because it has just a lot of uh, legal uh, language and terminology, and then also things like defining how frequent meetings are, and how are meetings held, and you know that sort of thing that goes into a nonprofit set of bylaws. Um, but what we do have in front of council tonight is an excerpt from that draft that focuses on um, the powers of the, the working entity named the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. And then also, um, I have a request for council tonight. Um, what I would like is for council to either recommend revisions or support the plan for the next step, which is to plan and launch um, a series of outreach conversations with other um, stakeholders and entities that could be potential members of the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. So um, you'll see in the packet the idea there is that we would convene first one-on-one -on -one meetings with these entities, um, the school board, a representative designated, and um, Mara Basora, uh, a Miami Township representative, a third Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce, um, fourth Antioch College, Tom Manley and designates, and then additional stakeholder conversations as needed that may emerge from those uh, initial outreach conversation guides. Um, the idea for these outreach conversations is that we would uh, discuss the purpose and membership vision that you have in front of you in draft, that we would discuss it in draft, and then we would, with those entities kind of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, brainstorm about potential opportunities and scenarios that might emerge from um, the existence of the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation, and also to um, capture any barriers to success or concerns that these entities might have. Um, we would then collate these scenarios and um, ideas and barriers to success and concern, and then schedule a larger group meeting um, with the stakeholders together to explore and workshop sort of that collated scenario list and then report the results of that activity back to council. So um, in the meantime, while those outreach conversations are going on, um, I propose that we would continue work on um, the code of regulations to get that language um, flushed out as well so that we can bring a full draft code of regulations to council to review as well. So um, you'll see that we're maintaining a timeline. I've been carrying this timeline forward without revision. Um, the, we're a little behind in that I had hoped by tonight to have a full draft of the code of regulations. But I think that the most important elements are the purpose, the powers, and the membership. I really think that's at the core of what we're trying to accomplish here. So that's why we brought that excerpt here for your review and comments. So uh, primarily tonight, what I'd like is for council to either recommend revisions or support the plan for the outreach conversations. And to the extent that you have comments tonight on the purpose powers for membership of the draft code regulations. We can entertain those or those could be provided in writing offline for us to take into the next draft. 
Brian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, I, I just want to, um, you know, also highlight, you know, something I've mentioned in prior meetings, which is that if our goal is, is true collaboration, developing this too much may work against that. And so I think that uh, I fully support what Lisa is suggesting as far as this is the time we've developed some ideas to really see where other stakeholders and entities are at before we get too far down the road. So. Um, well, I had a question uh, that I wondered if it shouldn't be in the, you know, where we're talking about the purpose and the powers, etc. cetera. Um, you know, issue, the issue of funding um, and how do projects get funded? Um, and I know, you know, there's the ability to apply for grants, etc. cetera. But um, if, I, I, I mm -hmm. So, um, my understanding is that that's up, up to us, and also uh, to an extent up to the other involved stakeholders. So, for example, let's imagine that uh, we're in the future and that our Yellow Springs um, Community Deve Development Corporation exists. And let's say it just has a small amount of money in it. Let's say just the revolving loan fund money. And uh, let's say that uh, an opportunity comes up, say, some kind of a housing, like a foreclosure, or some opportunity that um, the council is interested in. There could be an option then to put funds into the CIC for that purpose, earmarked for that purpose. So it isn't like you just put in a bunch of money and say, okay, well, we're all in, and then, you know, go and have a lovely time. It's not like that. It can be project by project, and, you know, the money can move in incrementally, or we can, make, you know, initially focus on the revolving loan fund. But in the discussions that I've been a part of, um, you know, the, the part of our village values related to affordable housing development and the kinds of actions that a CIC can do to help to promote those kinds of actions is, is for me, the most attractive element. The CIC can move more nimbly financially in that way. You know, ordinarily, uh, you wouldn't delineate uh, Village wouldn't delineate, you know, this is the process, or I mean, I guess would well, citizens know how uh, if money is public money is so put into the, you know, how that decision making. Yes, along the way, what we've been talking about is these are open meetings. You know, we've been we've well, we're still tracking on that. Just, uh, yeah. The CIC would not be deciding how to spend the village's money. I'm assuming a proposal would come from the village, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the village would then, if, if the village to put money or to come from, are being asked to come from the village, then it would come to the village. Correct. So this would be specified in the code of regulations, yeah. but at least in my vision, you know, it's this balance between being able to move more nimbly versus concerns about very you know, proprietary and appropriate use of village funds. The way I've imagined it more is that there would be very, very clear guidelines. So for example, if there's a certain amount of money for a purpose that goes into the CIC, that that money would need to be used for that purpose, yes, not, to, that, like not to receive that amount. So that no one could do something and say like, oh, we have this money, Thanks so much. Uh, instead of doing affordable housing, we're going to build a mini mart. You know, it's not like. No, that. I was thinking of you know how we have we had these guidelines for mm -hmm. nonprofits to come to us. Mm -hmm. You know, Homey, for example, uh, other nonprofits that have come to us and said, you know, we have this, we have those forms that say this is related to this village goal, and we are you know asking for this. So that's that would be a similar process. Exactly. I think it's even more than that. 
so yes and I think it also makes sense to have like financial caps and one of the things that we've heard a lot about is we've had some citizen concerns through economic sustainability is is this concern of having money for one thing and then it's spent on another or money spending over a certain amount and how does that feedback come back to council so I think that there's we're being very cautious in that way. But yeah. And then I think, I, yeah. I just want to add to that, I, I think just like with our commissions, this is a two-way street. So yes. you know, as they can to propose to us, we can also yes. use this as a tool to achieve right. our goals. Right. And in terms of the purpose, I had just a little wordsmith thing. I don't know if you're interested in this, uh, where it talks about uh, the CDC will advance the economic community, commercial and civic development and village to grow and strengthen this, the tax base. Um, and I just added to further village the, the village values and annual goals as established by the village. So rather than that it supports the village values and annual goals? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a little, I thought it made a, I don't know, a little stronger connection mm -hmm. between okay. those. Something like that. So piggybacking on that, the on on under powers, the last one K, it says it here the village values. And I, I was thinking of having the village values in some way up above there as well as as incorporated into the values of the CIC as opposed to a power that the CIC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get your point. It's kind of hanging down there. So it would be somewhere up in the front, but these, this is some of the values under which the CIC is operating. Yeah, I like that. I almost thought about, um, I was thinking about the way that all of the, the values were incorporated in the housing mm -hmm. purpose statement, which it was a lot of words, but it was also very effective once it was done. I almost wondered if something like that needed to be up in the top of the powers um, to really spell out those. I had some other comments that I can just email to you. That would be because great. mostly it's more like words and things. But I had one question, okay. which was about the membership. Um, I wasn't clear once. So we get the initial members, and some of them will be appointed by village council and by other entities. Once those initial memberships um, roll over, mm -hmm. does council then continue to appoint? four members or is it the membership itself that it's one? So the clear. ones that I've reviewed, um, and and Chris may have a different have, may have read more than I have, but the ones that I've reviewed, once the CIC is rolling, the um, CIC appoints themselves those at large members and the um, the council would appoint their people as well and as the, the other entities would report with okay. their members but the entity would identify the at-large members just like uh, a yeah just like that. a non-profit so board. I it wasn't clear from the way it was written yes. yeah. so in the draft yeah in the draft there's a whole section about how new members are identified so I guess that's something you can like what do you think about that I mean I that seems to be pretty standard practice for a 501c3 board, but yeah. Okay, there, yeah, there is a section in the draft. Um, I did have a question, and, and I know this has been discussed before, but I just want to be clear on the first, under corporation member shall consist of, um, on the last page, the four persons who currently serve as elected or appointed officials in Bull GL Springs and are appointed to the board by the village council. So we're talking about two council members and two staff members here? That's right. And you know, I, I really think, um, you know, it's not really on the update, it's not really in this document, but we talk again and again about capacity mm -hmm. right. and how busy staff is. And I don't want it to go unstated that forming this CIC is a lot of work and it's a lot of staff time seems like a lot of the other entities that have these, they have a person who's a planner that staffs it. Um, so I'm worried about staff capacity. I mean, I know that we have 
a lot of really complicated projects in the air. We have housing, we have the CIC, we have the infrastructure work. So I just want to acknowledge that this is not something that runs itself. Just think of some of the major nonprofits in town and how much it takes to keep the momentum going. So this is going to be something we'll need to think about as it unfolds. Is it the village that's staffing it, or is the village with the schools, with the township staffing? I think that's a great question for some of these conversations, because if there's a way that we, as part of the exchange of having these other entities involved, we not only gain by solving this challenge that we've had in the community that we don't always coordinate well among these entities but there also could be some capacity opportunity the other uh, places though where I've that I've investigated that we've read about they are staffed by the municipality but that doesn't mean we can't find another way I mean, basically, you need a good executive director, just like any 501c3, or a good coordinator. I mean, yeah. it seems to me that I, quite honestly, it's going to require a hire of somebody, ultimately. You know, it's a part-time person, I don't know. It could be a volunteer. I mean, there's a lot of volunteer boards. I mean, the Community Foundation, for example, in Yellow Springs, only recently hired an executive director. But so. I, don't, I guess I'm just saying. I yeah, can't it's going to be a fair amount of work. On top of you know mm -hmm. a village manager, yeah, a lot of work. Um, the other thing I just wanted to pay attention to is the the village council members who are on the the board. Um, what is what do you see their relationship to the whole council? i.e. are they just representing themselves are they representing the village council mm -hmm. you know are the what kind of communication happens between the the cic when they're making decisions and you know uh, the council they represent the council right just like you know, the other so members. when there's a discussion about mm -hmm. they represent it'll, it'll be brought here they represent council. yeah i just yeah absolutely yeah so i have a question you so now if i'm doing math right here okay. Is this a hard 13 members now, or before it was 8 to 10 or 11? Well, Brian and, Brian in our last meeting had had uh, asked for 11, and it, um, this has been a this has been a pinch point because um, you can't have a majority of elected officials on the on the board for a CIC, and so because we have this ambitious and unique idea to involve more formally the, the schoolship and the township. That puts the number of ele elected officials up, which causes the overall board to be larger. The, the story that I'm telling myself is that this is going to be a very busy group that's going to be meeting monthly, and that you want to have a nice, solid quorum. Everybody isn't going to be able to make it every month, particularly if we are able to recruit at-large members who are really knowledgeable you know people they are not going to be able to come and so 13 sounds like a lot to facilitate a decision-making meeting but on the other hand the odds of all 13 ever being there is probably minimal so it's probably better to have more so that you have a really strong quorum that's the story I'm telling myself about 13 members we there's no magic number we right. just can't have a majority and technically I mean, you know, what we're looking at is we have to have a minimum of 40% uh, elected officials. So if that is four, then we have a minimum of 10 on that board. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I mean, but we can talk about that. Uh, Patty, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say, as far as the, um, the, the staff time that goes into it, I think one way that we might solve that is to have um, one deeply involved staff member from the village with support coming from someone from the other, one of the other entities. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, those two people would work together, but the, the staff person from the other entity would be supporting the staff member from here with you know, documents and distributions and research and things like that. Well, I think the other thing that we've said is that 
we know one reason we want to do this is to reestablish the revolving loan fund, right? So, I mean, we can scale up staffing as we see opportunities. And, and don't forget, we do have an uh, economic development fund that is separate from the revolving loan fund, about 120000 I believe, that um, if we decided that we had some great opportunities, I mean, we could look at that staffing. Um, so I wanted to make one uh, comment about the purpose statement, and, and then I have a grammatical thing, too, that I can just share. But I think that um, educational institution should probably be in this middle part where we talk about businesses, nonprofits. Um, is that, you know, I, I think that is you know, part of what the village is about and what this you know, coordinated strategic planning is about. Um, and then my suggestion would be for these outreach meetings that we go in with the purpose statement and maybe not much more. Um, I think you know, the powers, it starts to get legal easy and all that. And so you know, I think we, we start with that framework and build off of that. Um, you know, we get that richer, more collaborative dialogue. So, um, is principal office? Was there some particular spot identified here? Well, I'm assuming it's the office down at the end of the hall where I sit every day. <laughs> but no one has asked me that specifically. No. <laughs> and I assume the other entities will appreciate that we can provide you know, some of that capacity. I mean, I, I think that's part of why this can be successful. So, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from council? Citizens? Okay, so at least I think you are asking for approval to move forward with the outreach. I am. I'm asking for approval to move forward with the outreach and continue to flesh out the code of regulations. Okay, and is everyone comfortable with that? Did you want our little suggestions? Sure, I'd love suggestions. I mean, that I talk about your choices and that. That would be awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, I also sure. think what Brian said of having maybe less material mm -hmm. for those initial discussions. Yeah, I like that. Less is more. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so Judith, I think uh, you are up next uh, talking about our uh, Justice System Task Force priorities. Yeah, so um, I brought this to council last meeting because I started to see, you know, the way we set up the task force is we gave it a two-year life, and then we extended it to the end of the year, and we gave the task force a huge amount of work to do. So. Uh, in the last months, there has been this grinding out of, of recommendations in response to what council asked the council to do. Uh, I think we've learned some things about uh, just how complex the work is and the fact that these are complicated recommendations. So how we, uh, I felt like it really was, council really needed to look at this when we're expecting input from the staff you know, in a way that really gives uh, gives these important recommendations, you know, the time and space to be fully considered. Um, the other thing that's come up with it, so, so there's that question, and actually, uh, you know, it's something maybe can be worked on with the, uh, with the president, you know, with the agenda planning process, the agenda planning process. But I just wanted to draw all of this to the council's uh, attention because the, the task force is writing out these recommendations and they, they're going to want to have some sense of how we're going to respond to them and, you know, what the time frames are. Uh, when I talked to Brian about it, he pointed out to me, well, nobody's going anywhere. People aren't leaving town at the end of the year. So, uh, so you know, so uh, even though the task force is coming to an end at the end of the year, it doesn't mean that we're going to have time to consider all these proposals and recommendations. The other thing um, I wanted to speak to is the uh, second meeting in September. Um, 
I've been saying for some months that I was going to bring a recommendation about a proposal about a justice system commission, and Brian and I are working on it together. Uh, we met with Pat, who I've been thinking about this for some months. Uh, we have it as a goal for the council for 2018 that we would make a decision. Um, and uh, Brian and I sat down with, with Pat DeWeese uh, about a week or so ago and discussed it. She supports us uh, creating a commission. Um, and at the task force, I have promised to bring, you know, an edited proposal to our next meeting. Um, part of when uh, Brian and I talked about this, um, I think we both feel that, um, you know, we've made a big commitment as one of our major goals around our justice system. And uh, there is going to be ongoing work to do there, and if there is not a committee coming, a commission established uh, when the task force ends, I feel like there's going to be a big gap there, and we're going to lose a lot in terms of what we've figured out, both what we've learned that has worked and what we've learned from what hasn't worked. Um, let's see. I also think it's important what we're communicating communicating to people who are interested in this issue, um, I mean, to everybody who's been paying attention to the task force. I know it has caused some discomfort uh, for village council, sometimes for the staff. Uh, the committee, the task force itself has struggled. Uh, these are very, uh, they're not just complex issues, but they're issues that people have a lot of feelings about. So that there's been some high emotions at times at our meetings. And Brian was pointing out to me certain commissions, you know, that aspect of the work, HRC might be another commission um, where it's really different than the Energy Board, say, in that regard. Um, but I think, you know, our, what we're going to be communicating to people about our, our real commitment to this work, um, I think it's very important that we uh, don't leave a gap but that we, we've been talking about, you know, the things that didn't work very well. We talked with Pat about that. We were imagining that a commission that hopefully would be formed by the end of the year would, would take some months to look back. Uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about, and uh, Lisa and I had a phone conversation with Vaughn Crandall, that's Beth's son, who has worked in these, in this, on this work for many years, um, is this whole issue of, really having measurable, when you make a policy change, okay, so how do you measure that, what does it mean, you know? What are the measurements, and how do we know if it's happening or not? And what's become clear to me is that that is not the job of the commission. That is the job of the council with the village manager, because we're talking about, and also the mayor, actually, not forgetting the mayor's court, but in terms of the police department, that's where that accountability should sit. And so partly, uh, Brian and I have been talking about it, we want to kind of state that uh, in the commission ordinance, uh, that that's where the accountability sits. But you know, we didn't really think that all through and figure that all out when we made these earlier recommendations. And so you know, part of the first piece of work the commission would be doing is kind of looking back. And some of the things that Mary Ann had put in her uh, comments about you know, taking some time to look back. Um, well, who's going to help do that if there isn't a body who has responsibilities to, to help with that? Also, I was thinking um, council establishes its goals at the beginning of 2019. We have an important goal around the justice system. And if, if we can get a commission set up so that by early in the year that those uh, members can help us establish those goals, and clearly, we need to slow things down, and we need to uh, give time to look at these recommendations that are already being developed and finalized. So, I'll stop there. Yeah, so I'll just, I, I think Judith uh, covered it very well, but I, you know, I really do think the metrics piece is something that is important, and, um, and you know, I did comment that when I look at our goals, I mean, I do think we're moving more and more towards structuring our goals around outcomes that we want to see. And so, I, you know, I think that's a really important thing to step back. And so, I appreciate uh, Marianne what you wrote, and also Judith what I think you're echoing about that pulling back 
evaluating and then thinking about how we measure the progress that we've already made as we move forward. Um, so then I think the other piece to kind of bring it back to what I, what I think we're talking about tonight is what can what do we feel like we can handle in our agenda uh, moving forward and again you know emphasizing that I think none of this work is going to go away um, it's just a matter of you know is, is uh, a new commission taking that on or I mean if not a new commission then I, I don't see how council can ignore these issues I mean we do know for example the civilian review board um, is something that citizens want us to consider, you know, whatever decision we make about that. So there are issues that I think we need capacity for. But again, tonight I think we're talking about, you know, based on what's in the queue, what what do we think we can uh, handle? Well, and yes. I was, I just had a suggestion, and this is to Mr. Process, that might help get a little bit more done. Um, before the interview with the things that are in the queue. Um, it seems like um, if staff and the solicitor were to get the, the draft recommendations um, and review them as soon as they're ready from the JSTF. And because it, we, twice now when we've sat down, just had one meeting, we've been able to, to work together, to come to a compromise, bring that right back. And I think if we do that on the front end, um, it, it saves time for the JSTF members, it saves time for the staff. So if the draft is ready and you send it and we all review it and then we maybe schedule a meeting where we can all sit down and secure our concerns, chief could be there, myself, Chris, the mayor, the JSTF members involved, and work it out and then bring it, I think that will maybe save the back and forth time and be respectful of everyone's time to help move a lot of these things along a little bit more quickly. It's just a suggestion that I have to staff. If I could add something. Um, I mean, when I read the memo, I, I thought it was well thought out. And it really seems to me that I, I think you're farther along than your comments suggest you are. Um, you've got guidelines there. You, they're pretty simple to follow. I mean, you've, got, you've got the blueprint of what the law says you can and can't do. The, the conversation is, I think, yeah. I'm talking about the memo, it was an impact that I have. Oh, the memo, that, yeah. that's, that's um, Lisa's going to be speaking to. Okay, but okay. but isn't that what we're talking about? No, no. <laughs> we're talking about the rest of the things that are in Okay, the I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought and I'll that back. Right, I apologize. We won't have any back on that. Okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, so I guess I would just suggest we maybe work with, um, I mean, I think that makes sense, and Patty, that is what we're trying to do with the notice and comment, only now we're just sending it to staff, um, and, you know, sitting down for a meeting with staff, once that awesome, as uh, Lisa did with the uh, mayor's uh, working group on that issue. So we, did it, we did it on the tape, or we did it on the mayor's court, and then we, we sat down and we got it all figured out and we moved right forward, and I think that, that will work best for everybody and be very um, considerate of everyone's time. Yeah. Well, so, so, since we're talking about the staff end of things, I mean, if we try to tackle all of these from now until the end of the year, mm -hmm. is that manageable? Well, the surveillance technology, I think, is supposed to come in the next meeting. Right. Um, and the mayor's court, I think that's probably why Dave's sitting back there. Waiting for the misdemeanor me. case is correct. Right. Assignment. Yep. Um, so I, I think um, that the civilian review, civilian review board and the diversion and restorative justice programs, mm -hmm. um, which kind of go hand in hand with the public defender. Um, so do I think it's doable? Yes. Is okay. it, would it be would it be a push? Yes, it depends on how quickly the recommendations come firmly out of the drafts come firmly out of JSTF. Okay. So um, but I have problems with this. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I did. I, you know, I wrote what I wrote, which more or less in general says the concern. But um, part of my problems is with the process. For example, and in particular, well, the Civilian Review Board and, and all the mayors, 
I would much rather that the Justice System Task Force come to council and say, let's say, let's consider the civilian review. This is something we're considering. These are the things that we have learned about it. These are our concerns. We're bringing it to council for a discussion at council. All of these things are hugely critical things, and they're being decided outside of council at this point, and then coming with the recommendations. And that is a problem for me, because at this point, I don't support any of these things, basically. Now, there are pieces that I think are important, but I'd much rather ha have a discussion at council about the pros and the cons, and then say, then go back to the JSTS and say, okay, this is what council is thinking. Okay, let's see. But I also, as I said, think that we just need to step back and let things work their way through the system and let the system adjust. And I do agree that there needs to be some way of looking Someone needs to be looking at that, but um, at this point, I would I don't support any of those things. The diversion, restorative justice, and prosecutor question was in our directive to uh, in creating uh, the justice system task force. In terms of providing a public defender for indigents, I think this is, was raised as kind of a legal question, and. Um, but, you know, it's, I, it, I'm back to, it's the chicken, it's like the, what comes first, the chicken or the egg. How do we have a discussion about it? The well, Civilian the, Review Board is not something that's really being recommended. It's being recommended, it's basically asking council exactly what you're asking. Do, should we, I mean, the task force, Pat in particular, said she didn't think we had the expertise to look into it. Do you want to look into it, council? If you do, you know, her recommendation was you should set up a committee. I know Brian said he thought it should just go to a new commission, that question. And, but you have to do some preparation. Well, yeah, you bring yeah, it to council, right? yeah. Yeah. Granted, but the way I'm reading this is that the, the Justice Task Force is going to come with a recommendation. I'm saying I want the Justice Task Force, first of all, to slow way down. I mean, I don't, well, I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're ready to deal with a lot of these things. But to come and say, these are the things we found out. These are the pros. These are the cons. Council, what? Wh where do you want us to go with this? As opposed to, we're coming to council. We've spent two years working on this, and this is what we want. And then if we say no, which then people get really pissed, and I don't blame them. I mean, Judith, you're the person who's always saying you need to have counsel. I, I, I agree, counsel. and I've been talking about it, and it was one of our goals that we would decide whether to have a commission, de develop a commission, or that there would be some ongoing body after the JSTF. That is a specific goal of 2018, and I'm bringing a proposal, and you can be against it or for it, and it can be changed and all of that, but until it's thought through, uh, I don't, you know, it's so like I say, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. Well, speaking of chicken and eggs, yeah. um, I think we can all agree that this is some heavy lifting and it will take time to do it right. Um, I think if we all can all agree on that, um, I th think we throw out, and I'm going to use the phrase, artificial timeline, you know, at the end of the year. When we say, okay, end of the year, then that drives all the things we're doing. I think that drives part of this process. It's like, here's a recommendation. It's, it's wrapped, tied, and got the bow on it. Uh, give me a thumbs up and thumbs down right now. Um, if it should take longer, it should just take longer. Uh, that, in theory, I don't care personally whether it's the JSTF reconstituted. Uh, or some other thing, uh, but, but, but we don't have to, in my opinion, decide first to do a commission just because we have a list of things that's too long to get done before JSTF expires. If anybody's got the will to just keep working on it longer, you know, change the name so you can say, okay, the JSTF ended and we just, we're just gonna continue doing these things so again, I think it 
echo some of Marianne's point about process where we're uh, allowing the calendar and the fact that we feel like we need to do something drastic with respect to whatever JSTF is, and all of those things are forcing how we approach things. And I suggest you know, we all have said, slow down, I think. Um, and, and again, if that just means, okay, today, JSTF is over. Tomorrow, whoever's got the will to keep going is, is part of this other thing. Doesn't have to be a commission. It can, it can be JSTF 2.0. Um, but because these things do take time, and there ought to be a process, um, you know, that, that is consistent with the way um, a group that is designed to extend our capacity, uh, not just throw stuff at us and, and ask us to agree or disagree. Um, I, I think we just ought to allow, you know, a common sense approach to sort of be the guiding principle as opposed to the calendar and this artificial deadline. Well, and, and so what I'll say, because what I'm hearing is I think we're kind of all in agreement. I mean, what I'm hearing, you know, Judith asked for is some clarity around what she can go back to JSTF with, you know, just in terms of what are our, our expectations schedule with. Um, and, you know, so I think that's why, I, you know, I feel like this is totally, this is a discussion, right? We're not committed to anything. This is what's, you know, again, I said in the queue. Um, but I think there are some things that we, we have agreed we're going to, you know, tackle. We are tackling, right? The surveillance technology, right? We, we've dealt with that. We're going to finish that. Um, the mayor's court proposal, which is in front of us, number one, we're going to deal with that. And we are going to have a biannual report, and we are going to talk about the status of the task force, right? I mean, so all those, I think, we're on the same page. Those can happen. So then, I mean, maybe where we leave it for now is Civilian Review Board. I don't know, maybe we, you know, we need to think a little bit more about, even though there's some pressure from some community members to make a decision about this, is that something we want to get into or not? But that's why this is on there. The other two mayor's court pieces, I agree. We've been talking about a prosecutor from the get-go, but when do we want to really dig into that? I don't know. I mean, this is where I hear Mary Ann saying, Maybe we need to let some things settle because a lot has been done. And then the public defender thing is new. So I'm not advocating that that would be tackled in the short term unless it naturally comes into play. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of what I see overall is that, you know, this is what's in front of us. We've committed to tackling some things. Um, and so maybe the message at this point is we may not get to a couple of these items that aren't already, you know, in process. I don't know. I think that, I mean, I like I said, I think we can work with agenda planning and kind of figure out, and, you know, Patty's saying if we sit down, we can, but I think for counsel to be able to also process it all and, and be knowledgeable uh, and prepared for some of these more in-depth discussions, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, maybe, uh, so I think we need to spread it out a little bit. I'm totally with that. And we're going to probably need more than one discussion on some of these issues, no doubt. Um, but um, but in terms of the Justice System Task Force, the task force is ending at the end of the year. And I believe the membership are done. They have they put their time in. They've been working really hard to try to complete things. And so what happens after that, I'm proposing Brian's working with me on a slightly different entity, and uh, and you know some of the work didn't get done. You're going to hear about that in the biannual report, and you know for that work to go forward, probably the most important thing in my mind is the disparate impacts uh, on poor people. You know that's something that you know it's a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time to figure out what to do about that, and. Um, it's going to take some fresh blood, really, to um, to do the work. I mean, people are, are tired. They've been working hard, and, and people are ready to take a break. But we're currently on a task force, so um, 
you know, I don't think we should leave a gap. Mm -hmm. And that, that shouldn't be a rush. We can talk about it. Uh, we've set up other commissions uh, because there was a need in the community. And, and you know, and I don't see it as a, you know, I think just having, you know, conceptualizing it, addressing some of the shortcomings of our task force so that the communication is better, uh, you know, between the YSPD, the mayor's court, and the committee, you know. Um, so I think there's a positive side that comes with sort of reconstituting and kind of starting afresh. And, um, but, part, but there's not going to be this grinding out a bunch of new proposals, but I don't foresee that. I really do think we need to take some time to look back. You know, council wants to, you know, council with staff and the committee uh, can, can look back and, and do a lot of what Mary Ann's talking about. But, uh, but I think we, I think that what it communicates, if we just let the task force end and there's nothing else in place, I think that's problematical. That's going to, I mean, I think the community has been very comforted by having the task force in, in spite of some of our, of our challenges as a, as a committee and, um, and have appreciated the work that it has accomplished. So I do want to say before we leave this issue that the process piece is something, and I believe I said this at the last council meeting, that I think we have an opportunity to really clarify even further. Um, you know, as, as Judy has highlighted, it is in our roles and responsibilities statement, but, you know, we definitely have some lessons learned around, you know, what Marianne, you've mentioned, and I think we all appreciate. Um, and so I do think, uh, you, you know, this is an opportunity to really look at those steps and, uh, and think about that, that flow. Um, but at this point, I guess I'm going to propose, per what you just said, um, maybe we will kind of look at it in agenda planning. Um, Judy and Patty and I have tried to sort of project out, you know, a little bit further to look at what things are there. And so maybe what we could do is uh, at our next meeting, when we talk about agenda, future agenda items, decide if there are some items that just aren't going to be in there, um, you know, from this. Or need to be pushed back right. a little bit, right. or maybe switched around since you guys did the work that you did last week. Yeah. And that might be um, you know, I've been an active participant in the Justice System Task Force. Um, there's a tremendous amount of passion and ideas. Um, I, I, I feel like uh, there's been these pent-up ideas that haven't really come forward to council, so I strongly agree that there's a process point. I think what I would encourage related to agenda planning and beyond is to have a project management hat on with a lot of clarity because these are huge projects and when I start to brainstorm in terms of feasibility, if I was a project manager and what would have to happen to get these things implemented, and what kind of resources and what the cost would be and it informs budget these are really big projects and i think that's a and i don't mean this as a criticism to the existing task force but i think there's this uh, there's this um, strength around having like ideas and passion but then the the uh, focus of uh, focus and implementation you know it hasn't hasn't happened around some of these and i think that's going to be important for agenda planning is it to think about feasibility and you know can we really get it done and I because I agree I've, I've seen the passion and I understand that these are all important but you, know, you can't do everything uh, you can't accomplish everything in a community our size with the resources we have so I think focus and feasibility are really important at this point when I think uh, next year 2019 when village Council is goal setting, you know, you know, having more specific. When I looked at the goals, that looked at the goals we had for what we were going to accomplish through the task force. I mean, it was they were unrealistic goals. Right. Um, they were huge projects. That, you know, I mean, so it was just a lot. But you know, I want to make sure the task force, the work that's been done, will not be wasted. And I think we will get to those. Proposals and recommendations, but I think it's uh, it's just going to take longer than the end of the year for sure. Okay. 
All right, good. Um, Dave, were you here to say something? Well, since it came up, yeah, I'd like to. It looks yeah. like Chris is moving towards the mic because he wanted to say something. Oh, well, you, well, he's, he's waiting for mayor's court. Well, so, I, 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 I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, David Turner. Um, I jotted down some thoughts on this. Of course, I've been thinking about it a lot. And this isn't necessarily in the order. I think, you know, Kevin, you made a good point, but it doesn't have to quit, nor, you know, get it done when it's perfect to get it done. My view is that the recommendations are recommendations. We should not be, as a task force, saying, here, go do this 100% of the way it is. Uh, we're making recommendations. The stakeholders, the people downstream, are the ones that have to figure out how to implement it. Um, a year plus ago, Marianne made a great, so you here then, made a, you know, a great suggestion, which I think still needs to be considered. And I listened to the last council meeting's discussion about this kind of a thing. And task force is a process and the village people have a process and the council has to have a process and those processes have to come together. Some way for taking those recommendations that are sent and looking at them and your suggestion was put them in a box, put them all together and then figure out what to do because some are going to overlap, some you can do right away, the taser policy, the surveillance maybe whatever, others are going to be more complicated. But looking at things together instead of taking them one at a time, uh, I think is a great idea and as it's a necessary thing. And you guys need to come up with a process for accepting what it is that the task force sends out. That was something that you know, has made it a little difficult. Um, I think the task force should finish its tasks um, and then see how it goes for a while, reevaluate and reform if needed form something to finish it up, but I, I don't, I personally don't think a permanent task force is a good idea because that says we can't fix whatever problems we have with our justice system and that's, that's pretty scary to me. Um, so I don't see that we need something permanent, but we need something longer because, yeah, you know, people are, you know, are ready to be done. Um, uh, and so people have to take the recommendations and see how and whether to implement them before considering permanent task force now, I'm repeating myself now, um, but you guys come up with a process for dealing with it and the back and forth between the people who have to implement it and the people making the recommendation, you guys, needs to be neater. Uh, we can go much quicker that way uh, and we can't do everything and we don't have to, we don't have to make the perfect enemy of the good, which I think frequently happens. We've got to take care of everything. If we get 80% reevaluate, we can get that other, you know, 19 and a half percent and be happy with that in the future. All right. Thanks, Dave. Hey, uh, I'd like to, this conversation is getting long, but I'd like to give an example of what I'm thinking about. Because it, it is process. One is the process, which is we say, okay, Police department send these misdemeanor cases to the mayor's court. You make that directive, and then giving that enough time to happen. So that's one thing. But the other thing is the interactive process between any commission and council. So I'm going to use the example of civilian review board. I Pat has written a paper which I don't think has ever really come to council. I what I would like is to have that paper come to council. That paper says things like, to have a I mean, citizen review board is a very difficult thing requiring a lot of money and expertise, but there are these other things. And have, have council be able to grapple with that some, because then the community hears that. Then one, the community hears, okay, council is looking at how can how can community members who have concerns and complaints about the police department find a way to have to have someone listen to those concerns? Oh, council is talking about this. Oh, okay, and, and it looks like there's this way of doing it, but and they do it like that in New York City, but it's pretty difficult. And you know, Springs, we don't necessarily have that expertise, but maybe there are some other ways we can do it. I'd like to have those that kind of discussion happen at council and then give some feedback to the commission and then maybe citizens are hearing that and they can respond and it creates more of a community conversation so that's what i'm talking about of having that iterative process of back and forth 
And then council could say to the task force, maybe, okay, it doesn't look like we're going to have a citizen review board because, but how about if you start looking at ways that come up with some examples or some options where we can have a process for citizens to have an independent place where they can go with their concerns. And compliments. So that's my I want to just compliment, say something nice about them. Yeah. Yeah. Usually they can do that directly. But it's the fear that people have of if they have a, if they're afraid of the police, or if they don't trust the police, they're not going to go to the police to say, hey, I didn't like it when, I don't think this was right. That's but but that is the point of this discussion. This is a discussion. I mean, in fact, you know, Pat wrote the recommendation, so that is it's it's a rec it's not a recommendation to do it. It's a recommendation to think about whether you want to. Yeah, that doesn't to me that doesn't come across. It, like, it may not. I mean, Beth and I put this yeah, together and right. try to capture it. But this isn't saying yes, we think this is possible. I mean, I know Pat has a lot of misgivings. A lot of people in the committee has a lot of experience that whether we can do this in this, in a yeah. So I guess to me, I frame it like, uh, okay, the, the, the justice system task force, whatever that particular part is, we're bringing this to council. We want you to understand the issues involved yeah. here. Right. That is the now. It's yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. Um, Chris, did you have something about this issue? No. Um, okay. So I think we decided what we're going to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, OK. And so uh, next up is Village Manager Search, which I guess my name is attached to. Um, OK, so there was a one pager that Lisa and I worked on um, for some of the discussion we had last time. So what we tried to do was think about sort of these bigger areas that are outlined here. Um, notice it is emphasized that you know we think it's really important councils mentioned this to really think about our diversity hiring practices and how that, those become part of this process um, so I'm not sh I think the document speaks for itself um, Lisa do you want to add anything or um, only just to underscore that the impetus for this document was us kind of trying to think about how each of us could be involved to our own individual skill set mm -hmm. in some aspect so that it isn't just two members of council carrying this whole thing along. So if we could work in pods of two in different elements of this just so that we could all be more involved since we're all passionate about it. I'd be willing, interested in working on number three and number five. So we're saying everybody will be involved, correct? Um, mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, part, partly, but I guess there is a procedural piece of, you know, sort of like thinking about the selection criteria and everything, you know, based on things we've done before. So there would be, I think, that work that would be presented to council to agree on. Um, well, I will say I, I'm, I am definitely interested in the communications piece. So, um, I, I, do we feel that the work uh, that was presented last meeting did most of three in terms of the time on the process? Do you need some more? more? I think it's there. I think it's really a matter of reviewing it and just kind of, you know, putting it into our timeline and everything. But I, I mean, I don't think we need to reinvent that for sure. Mm -hmm. I see May has a wealth of information on the website, and Lisa had noticed at the last meeting that this document is available on the ICMA website. I have it in an electronic version, but whoever is going to do this part of it as far as recruitment, I yeah, have this. Maybe we all have a copy of that. I can send it out to everyone electronically. It's 56 pages long, so 
you know, if someone wants this copy to mark on and take notes on, you're welcome to have it. Right. You know, <laughs> True. It. And then I can send it out electronically to everyone okay. to have. How many pages is it? 56. <laughs> it's front and back. Um, well, the most urgent thing is if we are in fact going to uh, engage a consultant, um, we need to get that RFQ out. And I think, I think I'm think i properly using RFQ here because to me this really is a search for qualifications around certain parameters of what we need. Um, and by the way, I, I do want to say because I think it might have been unclear at the last meeting, management partners was great for our last search. They just aren't what we need for this search. I, you know, so I don't want to make it seem that I was disparaging about you know what we got from that relationship. I think it helped us to, Kevin, what you referred to, lay down a process. We don't need that anymore. So I think one and two are concurrent work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also interested in the communications piece, but I think they inform each other because I, I think that what we're developing in terms of updating the job description and outreach informs the type of consulting support we might want to find. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be fairly concurrent. What about the RFQ consultant? I mean, do we have the last one? The last one? Sure. We must. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. But that's not something I feel. I mean, I was going to say, Brian, you were saying, I mean, to me, you know, the, the, the person who's going to, you know, do a lot of the, you know, looking at the background checks, um, we were supposed to send you, you know, what is it that we need from these, for, from a consultant. Mm -hmm. Did you get anything? Not yet. <laughs> from any <laughs> of us? <laughs> okay. Uh, and you were saying, you uh, you had a particular idea of what kind of person, what kind of these services that we need, which I do feel like we're going to need some more. Right, now. and actually, Lisa and I, I mentioned we had that conversation with Gavin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it sounds like Lisa's saying she's interested in that piece, and um, you know, I, I, I'd be happy to work together on that. that piece of one and two. The, the RFQ. Right, and then yeah, that can roll into number two. Um, but you know, I guess did I even put a date here? I said we bring it back for October first. So I guess I've kind of put decided to put some feet in the sand and sort of say, all right, here's where we're going to kick this off. So if we can work out our RFQ by October first, we can get it out after that meeting. I think we're in good shape for the timeline that we're talking about. So. So you're going to write it with, yeah. yeah, I think if everyone's comfortable with that, Lisa and I can do this piece, and then we have time to think about the other pieces. Yeah, right. I think you know, so. I mean, maybe the, the results of the RFQs, I think the, the things that come in, I think to Lisa's point, they should be, the proposal should say something, a great deal about communications. Um, you know, so that might sort of do that. Also, we ought to probably speak to, the proposals ought to speak to number three in terms of the overall process. But short of it is, let's see what we get back and then I think okay. more intelligently give up. So in terms of transition plan, Mary Ann's also already mentioned she's interested with somebody else because this this should be happening happening now as well. Um, would somebody else like to work with Mary Ann on? Okay. So am I supposed to start a draft on that? Well, that, why don't was my Kevin and I will meet with you to sort of talk about how it will come forward. Okay. okay. And I, well, I'll, I can do that that third week, or the week of the 17th, I'll be here. So, set up mm -hmm. so I would say, you know, so Judith asked about, um, you know, any thoughts about what we need from a consultant. So obviously prioritize that. But the other thing I would urge us all to think about, because Judith, you asked some really good questions about where the citizen committee fits in. I think that would be some thinking that we could all do as well. You know, so what what does the citizen committee add in terms of capacity and where do they plug in? 
because um, that's something I think we'll want to think about pretty soon. Um, okay. Uh, so that's that. Other thoughts about this? All right, so then we have one more piece of old business, which is our mayor's court uh, proposal. And um, are you leaving that one off, Judith? Or? No, I'm oh, Lisa, because Judith wasn't uh, at the meeting. So um, uh, back in May, um, a subcommittee of the Justice System Task Force, the mayor's court subcommittee, uh, brought a recommendation to council and when you may recall when that came to council there were concerns um, raised uh, by both the uh, chief uh, of police and as well as the mayor about I think it was my interpretation was that there were two things that were concerning um, one was capacity and the people were new in their roles and trying to just get their feet on the ground and get everything rolling effectively in mayor's court. And then there was also the more complicated issue of uh, police discretion as far as where different, you know, how the police choose to route different types of cases. So um, at that meeting, um, it was requested that we set up um, a meeting with uh, Mayor Kine and Chief Carlson and members of the uh, Mayor's Court uh, Task Force. Um, initially there was a meeting, um, there was no representation at that meeting from the Mayor's Court subcommittee, but um, Judith was there, I was there, um, the Chief, uh, the Mayor, and at that time um, the Chief had brought a document that identified some different levels of charges that he said, you know, this is what we would support um, having go to mayor's court. And at that point, the, the mayor was in agreement. So that document then went back to um, the mayor's court subcommittee to evaluate, because it was a fairly form, informal language. And, I think part of it, speaking for myself, was I um, I didn't know definitionally as much as the members of the subcommittee and the Justice System Task Force what all these misdemeanors were. For me, it was a great educational process. Um, also, you know, some of the complexity of if there's multiple charges. So the I think to the point that we were making earlier about the Justice System Task Force, there was tremendous value in having this series of meetings with representatives from the Justice System Task Force and the Chief and the Mayor together in a room hashing it out. And my experience of this series of meetings was that there was not resistance on any part by, you know, the police or it, it, it was just a matter of let's, let's educate everyone so we all have a common understanding of what these charges are and let's agree what we can do going forward because uh, it's complicated. So, um, as a result, we're now bringing back um, an amended um, policy and basically, uh, you can see on page, oh gosh, there's no page number, modification being proposed to council um, that all MMM1 violations will be cited to the mayor's court except for domestic violence, assault of, or crimes of violence, violations of protection orders, compact law suspensions, and misdemeanors where the offenders uh, and traffic citations where the offender is not a resident of Greene County because it just causes too much complication to try to find that person and deal with warrants. Um, also, all will be cited, all parking citations and all traffic standing or moving violations. So really, um, for the most part, this is very much like what the um, proposal originally was that was brought. Uh, now, the one thing that is exempted right now, everyone agreed that was at the meeting, is that um, although first time OVIs under the um, the law can be brought to a mayor's court. We all discussed and agreed 
the first time OVIs will be cited to Xenia because we don't have a prosecutor here. And that, um, you know, they have ability there at Xenia to amend the charges to reckless operation. We cannot do that under our current mayor's court. It's just not considered a best practice to have first time OBIs come to Yellow Springs Mayor's Court without having a, a prosecutor. So that's why that's um, exempted. Um, and so you'll see there's a resolution there. This is the basically same resolution that came before council before, <coughs> set for with in section one clarification. And I have in writing, uh, this, once this was drafted, we sent it to everyone who was at the meeting. Um, we have agreement, Mayor Kinnard supports it, and Chief Carlson supports it. So can I just ask about the OBIs, because I mean, you would sort of think that this would be a great reason to have a mayor support, because you know, that can uh, you know, affect your life very negatively and, and you know, whatnot. Um, so are, are we looking to, are there decisions about this or, you know, something that, you know, I, I mean, what is, where is the best practice coming from? Um, the best, the best practice um, at this point is that we just don't have the authority in our mayor's court to, mm, I don't want to say cut anyone a break, that sounds, reduce the charge. There is the nice word, reduce the charges. and. Mm -hmm. There, I got the sense, and Patty, you were at that meeting, that there is complete openness to changing to have first-time OBIs come to mayor's court, but only when there's a prosecutor who can negotiate those charges appropriately. That's correct. If, if you do not have, the mayor does not have the authority to reduce a charge. If a first defense OBI is sent to Xenia, unless it's egregious, you're going in, if the legal limit is 54.8 or, or lower, you know, or, or above, it's right, uh, OBI. Um, if you, unless you blow like a 0 .3, which is pretty egregious, you injure someone in a horrible accident, you are 99% likely to get that charge reduced to a reckless opt for first defense OBI. And, so it goes on your record as a reckless operation as opposed to an OBI. Um, Pam, as our mayor, does not have the authority to do that. Charges have to be reduced by the prosecutor. So um, she would not have the authority to reduce that. So if someone came to Yellow Springs uh, charged with an OBI and was found guilty, they would in fact be guilty of an OBI as opposed to a reckless opt. So, so to be clear, it's not an issue of best practice, it's just not legal for her to do it. She's not, she cannot legally reduce a charge. Right. Only so, the prosecutor. Right, she can. Uh, to me, driving under the influence of alcohol drugs is very serious. And, and I am very happy to have those go to Green County because to me that sends that message that this is serious. So I don't. I don't. I don't disagree. I just we took first OBIs before, so I'm just trying to get some clarity around what you know. Yeah, there are also, and other mayor's courts do as well. And, and but most of those mayor's courts are operated not by the mayor but by a magistrate okay. who's an attorney. Well, there's a prosecutor and there too. There's a prosecutor. And, and one of the things to keep in mind though is that uh, even when a, a DUI, OBI, DWI, whatever you want to call it, is reduced. Um, there's almost always a requirement that the individual go to a three day alcohol program, which Wright State is one of the best in the country, the weekend intervention program. There's one category, though, I need to clear up, which is to clarify something you said, Patty. This is not legal parlance, but it's, it's, it's slang, but it highlights the point. In Ohio, there's a, if one blows over or tests over a, a 0.17, call it super, super DUI, mm -hmm. it doubles the penalties. So it, it may be that, that a test above 1.7 uh, may want to go to Xenia Court because that indicates, assuming the test results are accurate, significant intoxication, 
more procurement by the individuals as opposed to below. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in the context of what, what you're looking at, what we've always been talking about is some restorative justice model, uh, having accountability because you've got some type of, you know, talk about terms of probation officer, but somebody that holds that person accountable lets the mayor know the way you would in a traditional court date if this individual hasn't been following through. It's all consistent with the principles that we've been talking about for years. So I, mean, I think this is a very well thought out comprehensive document in many, many ways. It probably needs to be tweaked minor in minor ways. It's fundamental and so I think it's a very sound document. Right. And the, I guess the last thing I would add to that is, is that when I got up before, to me, what, what the challenge you're going to have is, is, is the funding piece. You know, now we're going to, you know, we talk constitutionally about separation of powers. You are the legislative body. You provide the funds to operate that court. And so you're going to have to figure out, okay, we're going to have a public defender function. That's a contract. How do we handle a, a part-time prosecutor? That part-time prosecutor functionally creates or kind of blesses the diversion program you're talking about, but frankly the operation of the diversion program is really a function of, of the judicial arm uh, in, in a misdemeanor setting. But, but this recommendation here, we don't need to have the prosecutor because it's not it's recommending that that OBI is not going to make right? Well, but I... So but why I, don't we, when is this coming up for us to vote on? There's still a contemplation that there would be a prosecutorial function. I mean, that in the future. Yeah, yeah I mean, that if, but at, at this point, so before I, I answer your question, I just want to acknowledge and thank the uh, work of David Turner and Laura Curlis and Cindy Powell's and the Mayor's Court Subcommittee. This is clearly written and thought out, not because of anything that I did, but because of them yeah. and because of a really excellent couple of collaborative meetings where I think we demonstrated how quickly we can get stuff done if we get the right people in the room and just work it out. Well, I, it, I've been involved in, uh, in Montgomery County with the court system over there trying to create drug court and some other specialty courts. Um, my suggestion would be, based on that experience, go ahead and find out what all this is going to cost. You may find out that that prosecutor function is not cost prohibitive on the front end. So I, I, I would say find out, find out what it's going to cost, and then that will guide you on how you want to implement the, the steps moving forward. The document itself is very sad. I've started doing a little bit of back of envelope calculations. I mean, it, it seems like it almost covers, it may cover itself. I think we have to look at the. It, you know, what I would suggest, say that I would, in my experience, what you would discover is that the prosecutor would be a part-time position if you pay X amount of dollars. The public defenders would be paid on a per-case basis, although it could be done on a contract, it's just a blank cost, but until you get some idea of how many cases might, that might require public defender uh, assistance, some courts take the position any jailable offense, we will automatically assign you a public defender. Uh, but there's no legal requirement to that if an individual knowingly and voluntarily waives rights. Uh, and then you've also got your community outreach specialist, which is, I think, originally was contemplated to kind of play this dual role. So you already have many of the pieces in place. And I, and I would tend to agree with Lisa. I think just based on my experience, I think that uh, it is not a cost prohibitive to try and implement all, all of it at one time. But you can get those numbers in advance. But we can bring it forward. Yeah, right. I mean, it came, so this is a test of my learning, but we brought it forward one time before, but it's been amended. So this would come forward then for its first reading? If you're doing it as, a res as an ordinance, then you have to do it in two reads. If you're doing it as a resolution, then you're doing it as one reading. You've written it as a resolution, which is one read and effective as soon as it happens. I, I would recommend you do this as a resolution because this is a, this is a policy. That so it's written as a resolution. Um, all right, but I just I want to reiterate what Marianne asked. So approving this sure. resolution does not commit us to a prosecutor or a public defender, right? Correct. Okay. That wasn't the purpose of the resolution. It, the aspect of the resolution that speaks to that is simply to say that at this point, as a rationale, that we are not 
having first time OBI cited to Yellow Springs is right. pending the additional structures of our mayor's court that entities like, is it ACLU that just came out with a big white paper about mayor's courts? And so we're trying to work with the best practices. Okay. Because, I mean, I guess I just want to, and I know it's not the discussion tonight, but I don't want us to forget that, you know, for several years, mayor's court has, you know, been in the hole by about 40,000 annually. And I think we are going to really need to look at, based on the cases that come to mayor's court, what what would happen in terms of restorative justice and a prosecutor and a public defender. I mean, we need to be able to justify all those things. So, but I know that's I want to just doing step by step and getting this resolution or ordinance, however mm -hmm. we do it, getting it done. So we're doing that one step. And if I could ask a question and make a comment at the same time. Uh, all right, so when I see assault or crimes of violence, not all assaults are, are the same. So if you have two 18-year-old kids who happen to be at the high school who get a schoolyard fight under this policy, I would interpret that to mean the two kids get sent to Zenith. Um, that's going to leave that's going to leave a trail. Um, so I, I, does the, the policy is written contemplate it, that if there's an assault charge, it's automatically gone, or do the police officers have the discretion? To determine where it goes based upon the facts and circumstances, and it assumes it's not a relationship assault. Right. It's my understanding that the charges that are listed there that say accept, some of them have to go to Xenia, other ones officers can exercise discretion. So if it's, uh, it, it describes that under crimes of right. violence. That's right. That. That's right. Yeah. Um, we were talking about measurements you know, so that we can see how, and so did the committee uh, think about that question, so how did we? Well, I mean, that's a process question, right? So we didn't write out an entire process in the resolution, but it does say that um, there'll be at least a quarterly report, and we did address that, um, you know, ideally it would be, um, you know, a data subcommittee kind of an entity that would help to track um, the data that's in those memo. Dave, were you wanting to make a comment? Yes. <laughs> well, no, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a brand new, it's a perfect example, I think, of bundling things together. Uh, and this, you know, this, this, is a, you know, this is a good example of how, you know, we can do these, these fairly simple things quickly. One piece, I'm not claiming to be a lawyer, probably speak to this better lawyer at Laura Speed and send to us. Um, somehow, I'm not going to explain how this might be wrong, somehow if we do it wrong here, somebody gets a free pass in an OBI to your driving drunk is a bad thing. So my understanding is the mayor's court is not a court of record and that could happen because of that. However that works out, that's another issue with the first time OBIs, if that makes sense. Um, most of the work was done by Laura in writing this, so she deserves a lot of credit for it. We have, subcommittee, several different things. This is the first one. They all go together, again, thinking of bundling and putting in the box. Some kind of diversion program, no details yet. Some kind of diversion program. Some kind of public defender access. Uh, some kind of prosecutorial magistrate, whatever function. All of these are recommendations that we are, want to make, have made. Uh, to, in various ways, to the task force and on this one, to you guys about making some changes in the way things happen to go to mayor's court. The numbers for the past 25 or so years, according to David, that, that we saw were that the, speaking of your money issue, uh, 20 to 30 cases on average going to the, to the mayor's court, and it was paying for itself and even making some money. Even though it wasn't supposed to be a money-making operation, it's not anybody's plan. Um, so, for the longest time, it was paying its paying its way because people ran enough stop signs and they went to mayor's court. Then, when we got a different police chief about six and a half, seven years ago, they stopped going and the volume dropped to about 20 cases a year. So, if you do this and we start sending more people to mayor's court for the things that they're already the crimes are already committing, it might actually pay for itself again. You might have a little money left over to pay for a prosecutor and. A public defender that shows up every once in a while. So 
We're not saying with this, oh, we're going to prosecute, we're going to do all these things. We're saying we're going to do this one thing with sending things to mayor's court. And by the way, a prosecutor will really help fix a lot of problems. Magistrate is whatever you want to call it, so it's not a scary word to people. And these other things with diversion programs, et cetera. So those are downstream, but this is only about the what we send to mayor's court, what we require people to send to mayor's court. Court record that uh, this this is a good process once we finally are able to get it going. My view as the subcommittee member and a member of the task force is that we said, hey, why don't you go do this? We went back and forth. Now it's off our plates. And it's on the somebody else's plate to do this, perfectly willing to come back and talk about it, but it seems to me that this is a process whereby we've gone back and forth, but now it's up to somebody else to take this and run with it. That's, you know, Patty and Chief and those people. So that's how I see this. Um, I think I've seen that. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so um, I guess the, uh, what we're looking at is bringing this back as a resolution for the next meeting. I think that should be fine. Okay. Um, great. So we're ready to move into new business. Okay. That's great. Um, all right. Thank you. Yes. All right. So RV parking. Hat. Um. So just to make it very brief, um, there is. Um, there are regulations in the zoning code that have to do with parking an RV on the street for more than 72 hours and someone living in it. But these, the complaints that we get about RVs parked on the street would be better served by moving that to the general offenses code. Um, the reason that I'm saying that is because a lot of times there are vehicles that are parked on the street, they are RVs or construction vehicles or trailers that full construction equipment they are parked on the streets, they make it difficult for our crews to get through in the wintertime with plows or larger equipment. They make it very difficult for emergencies uh, vehicles to get through. Um, so we are suggesting as a staff, and this has also been unanimously recommended uh, by the Planning Commission, that um, there be, number one, a text amendment um, on RV parking and storage within the zoning code, but also the addition to the general offenses code of um, the parking regulation that you see there, 452.20, parking of trucks, construction equipment, and recreational vehicles on the public streets. Um, right now, that does not include recreational vehicles. It makes sense to put it there. All of those things can then be enforced by the police department um, to get folks to move those out of the way of the vehicles. Um, the, our, our work equipment, the emergency vehicles, those kinds of things. Um, we do frequently get complaints about this. We do have some streets in the village that this is a really big problem on. Um, and we're not a lot of smaller streets and public sites. Mm -hmm. so, what level of misdemeanor would it be? Um, it, well, as far as that, it would be just a parking ticket oh, okay. um, at that point because it's in the general offenses code under parking. So it's just parking ticket. Do the people okay. who are parking these kind of vehicles on the street know this is a discussion? Um, well, we generally what happens, Judith, is somebody goes and knocks on their door and says, hey, we really need you to move the vehicle off the street. It's causing a you know, traffic hazard or something like that. Um, the, the enforcement part of it is the issue right now. If they don't move it, you know, we, we have this very lengthy process that we have to go through, kind of similar to making people cut the grass. Um, and it just would be much simpler to handle it this way. They would still get the knock on the door that says, hey, can you move this? The other part is, Johnny doesn't have the right to, to run someone's license plate to find out who owns that vehicle. He doesn't really have that right. If it goes into the general, the general offenses and becomes enforceable by the police department, they can then track that owner down more expeditiously and knock on the right door. I guess I'm wondering from the point of view of, you know, yes, if it's there for a long period, but if it's there overnight or, I mean, I guess I'm just wondering why, from the person's point of view, who's parking something there. Um, if, yeah, this is not for the overnight people. This is for the people who 
just, I'm not going to move this for a year and I'm going to sit it. Sit it. I mean, this is literally what we're talking about. I didn't know we needed to hear from now. Okay. Yeah. I think it says 72 hours for unloading oh, okay. and loading. It, for oh, it's 72 hours. hours. I saw the unloading, but yeah. uh, okay. We're actually looking at, you know, I know it was so looked. It's been in a court for three years and we've had to fly around. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. Stuff like that that's parked in our ways. We can get to dump trucks, plow trucks, all of that when we have no authority. Why are motorcycles listed? Probably for quads on trailers and stuff like that. Not actually motorcycles. It would probably be a recreational like sports bike, a dirt bike, and all that. Because they're not licensed. All right. So should we be clear about that? I mean, well, they, they would be parked on a trailer in that in that right. regard. Then I'll license. Vehicle, yeah. So if it's not. if it's a licensed motorcycle, it's just considered a motor vehicle. It's not going to be considered <coughs> under the system. It would be recreational or something. Okay, as long as that's clear enough. I just thought 1260.03 Part B was a little confusing because I see that part about, you know, you can have temporary occupancy for periods of up to 72 hours so long as it has sleeping, but the earlier part of that just says, except for the expeditious loading and unloading. So to me, loading and unloading and sleeping in it for up to 72 hours is two different, I don't know if it needs to be split into two different points, because to me that's two different things. Well, yeah, but what it says is, and I, I can see where it's a little confusing, so the loading and unloading has to be, it has to do with if you're getting ready to go on vacation, mm -hmm. you leave on Friday and pull it in there on Thursday and load it up and take off. Um, but it says, this provision shall not prohibit the temporary occupancy, so you can then park it for 72 hours on the street if you're having visitors come to your house and mm -hmm. you don't have enough room in the house and you're going to put them in there mm -hmm. because it has sleeping quarters, you can be there for 72 hours um, without you have, being asked to move it. I see. So it's like as an exception correct. to the loading and unloading That's thing, correct. you also could do this for 72 hours. That's and, correct. And a couple of times last year we had, or even this year, we've had them pull up on the side of the road. They've actually stayed there for three days. If they were there for the fourth day, and then we would be able to say something, they need to move on a little bit. Or Got it. Move it up onto their property or something? Yes. Put it back here. How far do you have to move it to get a new 72 hour clock? I prefer not to aim to that. <laughs> Stuff happens. So, so are, we, are we enforcing it in all instances or in instances where there's a problem? Well, I mean, it's it, well, it, not causing anybody any problem. Is it something if, that can. If we do, it, it's complaint driven. If we get a complaint about it, then we're going to go out, knock on the door, and say, "Hey, okay. look, I need Like last year, we had parked out here by the Bryant Center, and what we did is we went and asked them to back up about ten spaces because they were all the way to the front, and you could not see the exit Dayton Street, so it was a safety hazard. So we had to back up to where you could actually see traffic coming and going. Okay. So. I mean, just to go back to the 72 hours thing, it says is parked on a lot in a residential district. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that means it can be parked on the street and somebody can stay in there? This is, well, the, the RV parking and storage of 1260.03, that's in the zoning code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what that is saying is if you have uh, one parked on your lot that you're te technically storing, you park it next to your house, which a lot of folks do, um, somebody can stay in that for 72 hours. It can also be parked on the street for 72 hours um, for, well, no, I guess this would actually change that, wouldn't it? So it could not be parked on the street. Right. Because we're going to get heard. to the general offenses. Right, that's that, that's that yeah. sentence. That right. So, we'll, so that's in the zoning code. So that part is on your lot. So why can't they, if it's on the lot? Uh, if it's on the lot, they can stay in it for 72 hours. And why is that if it's only 72 hours? Because it's not considered a permanent habitable dwelling. No, I understand that, but I'm imagining people go on vacation, they go to visit their friends, they're in one of these RV things, they pull onto the property, and they stay for a week. <laughs> well, yeah. again, it's that complaint a, driven. So it's complaint driven. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's not causing any problems to the village. And, right. And, 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 and if someone did complain and we went out and knocked and they said, hey, they're only here for a week, okay. three, four yeah. more yeah. days. And we'd be able to explain to the right. complaint. 
So these are very primarily circumstances for us. Right. So, so it's it's two is the primary issue. Right. It's two separate things that you're being asked to consider. The one is an amendment to the zoning code as far as occupying it on a lot. Okay. The other one is the parking on the street that would be moved to the general offenses code and enforced by the police department. I don't feel like I care if they were on somebody's lot myself. Wait, again, that has to do with whether it's a permanently habitable dwelling. Yeah, I know, but as a, sometimes people have temporary situations. I just, it's not bothering anybody. I don't want to get involved, quite honestly. I just feel like when we're putting a lot of restrictions on what people are allowed to do on their own property, of course if it's affecting the neighborhood, it's affecting the community, you know, there are things that people can't do, but it's not bothering anybody. Well, Why are we making an issue And this? again, if it's not bothering anybody, we won't get a complaint, therefore we won't be taking the action. Do you want to just move ahead to legislation and discuss it at that point? I mean, this is not your final decision. This is an opinion recommendation and yeah. legislation. And you could, you could move the general offenses legislation to legislation and make it parking on the street and then discuss the text amendment to the zoning code when that comes. So is that what we want to do? Yes. I mean I, I think I do think they're potentially two different issues. Mm -hmm. um, so um, and I have mixed feelings as well. Um, and I think we should just change motorcycles to dirt bikes or something, just okay. so nobody sort of says, hey, I mean, just so it's clear what we're talking about. Okay. We'll talk about this next time. And, um, okay, so that brings us to Mary. So, yeah. But for our next meeting, are we having presenting two pieces of legislation? No, because the text amendment will come from Planning Commission when Denise brings it. Okay. So we're, what we're bringing is the legislation for amending the General Defenses Code 452-20. Okay. All right. What you're bringing. All right. Okay. Thank you. Which I think is an easier decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Overhead projector. Um, cut it. At the, the next meeting, we will, I will come with a proposal after Judy's gathering some interest in the cost of putting an overhead projector here. We can show on the screen there the cost of the projector and the installation. And when we have that discussion, can we pull down that screen too? Because I want to see what the size of the current thing is. Okay. All right. And then you had. Yes, I will move this. Yes. Uh, there's an Antioch senior, Rachel Isaacs, who met with. Me, the chief, you, Patty, mm -hmm. maybe that was it. Um, she is interested in doing a senior project about something about the village and would like to do something about uh, it, police community relations. And she's working, as I understand it, off the idea uh, of an ACLU project that they did in New York City that actually enables people to come together and share their experiences and perceptions and the police in some way would be involved in this. So it's really a, a way for citizens to learn about other people's experience and for the police to learn about that as well. And, and probably for the citizens to learn about what the experience is like for the police. So she sent me an email uh, and said that she uh, would like to know how to go about conducting a study in Yellow Springs. I'm not exactly sure what she meant. And also where she can get postcards, cards for people uh, similar to the project in New York City. People had cards. And the cards might start with something like, you know, uh, where did you go? But start, answer different questions. And then what was your first interaction with the police or different things? So I'm leaving town, I'm not going to be here really for the next couple weeks, and I wanted to see if, well, if HRC could get involved with this or, or anyone. I thought the chief was working directly with Rachel to start moving. Right, I think that's where it is now that chief, or she asked chief to make the ACLU 
Well, the ACLU of Ohio said they don't have the capacity to act. Oh, not even for the cards. Okay, and that was a response. Have the chief reached out to you? She did. She reached out. Okay. Well, I don't know. I assume she reached out. Marianne, if you want to send it to me, I'll follow okay. up with Rachel. All right, thank you. And, and I, w I will in my, uh, add that Marianne's been very gracious with this. It was Marianne that read the ACLU article and brought it to the HRC. And I don't know, I think, I think the student wrote me and said, hey, senior project, want to do something? And I was, I was very impressed with this. Yeah. Yes. And she also works with YSO, so mm -hmm. there's some things you can do on YSO with this. So it could be a cool project. Yeah. So, Kevin, do you want to stay in the loop at all? Or yeah. Like to see? Okay, so I'll send her email to the two of you. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. All right, manager's report. Um, I don't think there's really anything in there that we need to go on. But, um, I did just notice there's a not a complete sentence on the tree ordinance. <laughs> I um, thought it was me. I didn't want to say it. Um, but there will be an amended tree ordinance <laughs> in the next packet because I amended it today after meeting again with Lacey and Anna. Um, and in fact, we'll have two ordinances, one um, creating the tree program, which is necessary uh, to become a tree city and the other one creating the tree commission in a way that is consistent with our other boards and commissions having been created. So we will be breaking those out into two different ordinances and they will be in the next packet. Other than that, um, the best guess for the paving is mid-September. Still, as soon as we find out, um, well, as soon as Johnny finds out, because I am again, remember, on vacation next week trying to get my time in, um, Johnny will make sure that council gets an email and we put out public notices and Megan will be kind enough to publish them when I go, ah! <laughs> so, um, and the Bryan Center parking lot will be closed while it's being paid for a couple of days. So people will be directed to park in other spots. So related to discolored water, um, someone made the comment that whenever we post that on Facebook, we should act like people have never seen that post before so we should be consistent about if you want to get drinking water we have it at the Bryan mm -hmm. Center like just kind of making sure that our messaging is always complete because I, I know that you know some people have seen it but maybe you know there might be some new people that not. I, I thought we were trying to be consistent but maybe we missed that mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we was I'll go back and double check on um, let me give you an update on the groundwater because we've had a couple of complaints over the last couple of days. Uh, since we started the unidirectional flushing program out of eight valves that we rotated, we had four break. Uh, we actually got one of them 100% fixed. Um, it is at the corner of Longview and Corey. It took us digging them up. It took us two and a half days to get a final shutdown to where we could actually repair the valve versus putting in different valves, uh, called it inserted valves to be able to do it. Um, working with the EPA on that, we put out brown notice that we had the house fire on, that was on the 23rd. On the 24th, we had the house fire, which we were so grateful that the top didn't blow off the valve to keep the fire flow. Uh, after that, we was able to dig up the valve get a complete shutdown on it. We got that fixed on Thursday. And again, they had to over into a hydrant today because the basement caught back on fire and they had to dump more water on that house. Uh, so we've had some citizens call and concern because the water's not settling down. Uh, but we've made major flow over the last week and a half to 10 days. Uh, so hopefully after today, it's going to slow back down until the next emergency happens, but we still have two valves that we got to replace and or try to dig up and repair on Northwood is one and Whitehall is the other one. This is eight valves out of 400. So we're not hitting a very good odd right now. I've talked to the EPA. I've talked to Ohio Rural Water. Uh, this one that broke on Birch or on Corey and Glenview, it was not the packing that they thought was the easy fix. Actually, when we rotated the valves, it actually broke the bolts off of the top on it, mm -hmm. which is the top piece, and actually three out of the eight bolts broke, which caused water to shoot out. 
Remind me why we're turning them. I we're turning them for giving the directional flushing to be able to get the water to change directions, to be able to flush the iron and manganese out of the pipes, to be able to so clean up the water system. If four out of eight broke, does that tell you, I mean, what is, does that say maybe the thing to do is just replace them? Way or we're looking at a large cost if we if we can keep moving like we're moving the only thing it's doing is going to slow us down uh, luckily we have been in very good contact with the EPA they're up to date on where we are they said just keep on going now mind you we've been doing this for two months we just now started turning valves on the 22nd we have actually had to cut open 32 lids we've had to dig up 16 just to get them to grade where we could actually get to the valves they've been buried under block top. So we've been working consistently for two and a half, three months to get to where we are now. And now we start turning them and four out of the eight work. We've got one that's completely broken, it won't turn them. And you are tracking which ones you're replacing so we that are. as we get through it the first time we can go back Correct. and start working on just replacing them a little more. So we're going to start budgeting for the EPA. We talked to them, we dropped to Ohio River Water on what the best practice moving forward is. We can't stop, we've already started, and EPA wouldn't let us stop if we wanted to because it's part of the system we've got to get clean. So we're just Taking it slow and steady, and I'm hoping to get the flush in by the fall, by the end of fall. But as the way it's going right now, I, it does not look like we're going to be flushing this fall. But we did use a lot of water in the fire, so it got cleaned up on that side of town anyway. Okay, Chris. I think. All right, Judy. Well, I'm not going to say I'm going to read part of this just because. So every time this time of year, I'm mourning the closing of Gaunt Park, but I really want to thank, because I know I'm speaking for a lot of people in town. Thanks Samantha and her staff, of fantastic uh, young folks who made summer a great time for many families this year. I want to recognize Johnny's crew for timely, detailed work on the pool area. They got it up and running on time, kept it in great shape all season. And all of that would not have been possible without the commitment on council's part to assure that this asset is treasured and funded. So it bears repeating, there are a lot of families who are not able to leave town for a traditional vacation. So this pool, our ballpark, the youth center, the skate park, fireworks, all the festivals, the events in town, these are everyone's great summer memories. So thank you to council, Sam and crew, Johnny and crew, chamber, everybody who makes things happen here for a great summer. And also, it's getting dark earlier, and we have a new influx of little weenie flashing light things that you need to put on yourself and your bicycle if you're out late. We've got them to give out down in the PD, so please go get one. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, finally, future agenda items. So can I just stop for a second? Because please, I'm sorry if I missed this, but there is a letter in the packet from Jim Hammond. He was here earlier. He left. But we didn't talk about that. Yeah. Did you mention it? Yeah. yeah. All right, so are we going to talk about that more? Is that something that the council is interested in reconsidering? As kind of a new, a newer person in council, I wasn't involved I'm not. in history, so I just was wondering. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it comes not, up, you know, <clears throat> it keeps coming up. From one person. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I guess I'm also not interested in putting, putting that on the agenda, but I don't know how other people feel. Um, actually, when we made that decision, you know, we had a lot of consensus at that time. We um, did not agree. Yeah. All right, thank you. I don't know why I missed that in the preliminary. Yeah, I did that under. Yeah, sorry, I might have missed that. Just the, felt that, um, that it was taxing. Thank you. Um, but what that does remind me of, and it kind of relates to future agenda items, is when we, as we are getting towards our budget discussions, I do want to be thinking about the lodging tax in particular because I personally believe that the reason why we're levying that tax, and I think there's actually an expectation, is that it goes into community development kinds of projects. So. I, I guess a part of the budget discussion that's important to me is to think about some of these funds and 
sort of logical ways that we're using them. And I, I don't disagree with what you said, but I'd also like to say that I think that one thing that should be considered is some of the overtime budget that we have to pay staff for some of the events that people come to town that stay at the hotel. Well, says, yeah, and I, I put that into community development, but I want to make sure we're okay. matching some of these right. funds, you know, in a logical way. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay, so other uh, thoughts about future agenda items? We've obviously got a lot of things. <coughs> I do need to add, we've gotten the re resolution back from the uh, auditor for accepting those rates, so I've added, I've got that on my other agenda, so adding adding that to, and then a mayor's court, mayor's court resolution, mm -hmm. and a million general funds of So Is the mayor's court resolution coming up the next meeting? Yes, I understand. And the draft is in the packet tonight. Right, but I'd, I'd like to get a copy of the word doc. And there's a couple of minor cleanup things I'd like from that. Yeah, I think Lisa has. Them. What do I have? You can send the word version of the mayor's court. Send whatever you have. I can. Yeah, okay. I'll send it to the PDF. I'll send it to the board. I have it how. Ordinances one and two, or we we're doing both the tree. Um, I don't have them ready. Do you want them? Brian, <coughs> do you want both of them? Uh, sure. <coughs> two. And there is no second reading of 2018 Sorry. Well, it's and Chris, you were doubtful on the surveillance technology. Is that a yes or a no for the 17th? It, it just depends on what Ellis's schedule was like. Right? We have, we're probably going to have to talk at least twice. We need to get the DCIC stuff back. I've got you. DCIC update. Yeah. Yep. I've got it. And then I've also got a projector discussion. And uh, both. Brian Cowley, did you want to vote 16? I'll vote 16. Uh, local gun control. Yeah, so I'd like that to be on the 17th. Gotcha. If we can, if we can fit it, <laughs> we'll go on Friday. I don't think we have a Okay. So Mary Ann said probably not a housing report. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone.